Richard, we're going live now. Ladies and gentlemen of the Health and Wellbeing Board of Hertfordshire, uh, members of the public, um, of, of whom I hope a few have uh, tuned in, uh, welcome to this meeting, uh, which we haven't had uh, in public since January, and an awful lot has happened since then. But before we get going, I have an official uh, announcement to make, uh, which is to uh, define the status of this meeting. Following the government announcing that the UK has now moved into the delay phase of the response to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with the rele relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there's a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Hertfordshire Health and Wellbeing Board are asked to keep their microphones and cameras switched off until called to speak, and to switch their microphones and cameras off once they have finished speaking. To indicate a wish to speak, members should request to do so using the chat function, and, uh, and I think we're all up to speed with that. I would also ask members to indicate their support or otherwise uh, for each agenda item with agree, disagree or abstain. Um, officers and speakers are also in attendance, but will keep their cameras and microphones switched off unless called to speak. And uh, Nicholas Small will take over the meeting uh, in the event that the interweb decides that it's not going to play ball uh, with uh, at my end. Um, I have uh, apologies, um, but uh, Paul Burster gave his apologies, but he's actually on the meeting at the moment, has to leave at 11. Ian McBeath has to leave at 11.30, about half an hour for a virtual funeral. Um, good luck with that, Ian. Um, and I think uh, moving to what I think is really quite uh, exciting, uh, for me anyway, is to welcome uh, a little bit of a, a change of the uh, board and to welcome Jane Halpin, who is the new ICS Chief Officer. She has taken over from uh, Beverly Flowers and Ian McBeath, who were the joint chief execs under the STP. And Jane now uh, takes over as ICS as Chief Officer. Uh, and as, as, of course, Paul Burstow is the chair, independent chair of the ICS. Uh, Christine Allen, uh, West Hearts Hospital Trust uh, Chief Executive. In other words, uh, uh, um, uh, Chief Executive of uh, Watford, uh, Hemel and St Albans Hospitals. Claire Hawkins, uh, Harvest Community Trust uh, Chief Executive. You're welcome. Tom Cahill, full-time member, has been with us uh, as part-time uh, Chief Executive for, of uh, HBFT, our Mental Health Trust across Hertfordshire. And Sarah Wren, who is representing the voluntary sector and is the Hertfordshire Independent Living Service Chief Executive. That's meals on wheels to you and an awful lot more. Um, I would now like, um, uh, it, it, it might take a little longer, but I'd now invite uh, members to introduce themselves. Uh, no need to say too much, but just introduce yourselves, uh, switch your camera on so that uh, we and the public can uh, see you and put a face to voices. So Teresa, can I ask you to come first? Thank you, Richard. Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, County Councillor Teresa Heritage. My portfolio at the County Council is children and young people, and I'm also the deputy leader. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, then Nicholas. Good morning. Uh, County Councillor Tim Hutchings, uh, Cabinet Member for Public Health and Prevention. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Nicholas. Yep, morning everybody. I'm uh, Nicholas Small, Dr. Nicholas Small, Chair of Hearts Valley's uh, Clinical Commissioning Group and also Deputy Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Do you want to say where you're a GP, Nicholas? Oh, right. Yes, GP in uh, Hart, well, in, obviously in Hertfordshire, Elstree and Bushy Heath at Shotwick Surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Prague. Morning, Prague. Oh, you're on mute, Prague. Yes. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Prague Mudley. I'm a GP in Stevenage and uh, Chair of Eastern North Heart CCG. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and uh, Stephen, Stephen Palmer. Hi, 
Steve Palmer, Chair of Health Watch Hertfordshire. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Jenny, Jenny Coles. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jenny Coles, Director of Children's Services at Hertfordshire County Council. And uh, is, is there anything about this year that's particularly different than last year, Jenny? Would you like to tell us about that? Oh, sorry, I've been very quick taking my video off. And I'm also president of the Association of Directors of Children's Services. Yeah, we don't have that many presidents on the Health and Wellbeing Board, so uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, and just to uh, for those uh, who are, are watching, we're going to take Jenny's paper uh, immediately after introductions. Uh, Jim. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm Jimmy Mullis. I'm the Director of Public Health. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Ian McBeath. Morning, everyone. Uh, Ian McBeath, Director of Adult Care Services for Hearts County Council. Thank you. David, David Lloyd. Good morning, everyone. Uh, David Lloyd, Police and Crime Commissioner in Hertfordshire. Thank you. Uh, Tony Kingsbury. Uh, thank you. Good morning. I'm Tony Kingsbury. I'm leader of Welling Hatfield Borough Council and a district uh, council rep on the board. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. And Martin. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Martin Steers Hanscom. I'm leader of North Heights District Council and, like Tony, representative of the district councils. Thank you, Martin. And uh, Richard. Good morning. Um, I'm Richard Cassidy, Chief Exec with East Hearts Council, and I'm representing the Hertfordshire Chief Executive Coordinating Group. And thank you very much for joining us, Richard. I think this is actually your first meeting, isn't it? Although you joined us a while ago. Yeah, I'm definitely a, a newbie to the Health Wellbeing Board. Good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much. I should have introduced myself, I suppose. Uh, my name is Richard Roberts, uh, County Councillor for the King's Langley Ward. And I'm uh, responsible for uh, adult and social care in Hertfordshire and its relationship with health and chair the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Um, now, we've also um, lost three members from the board, uh, and I would like to thank them uh, profusely. I've already mentioned uh, Beverly Flowers, who with Ian, um, so uh, manfully and womanly, uh, were chief executive jointly uh, to for, for the STP, as well as doing their day jobs. Beverly, Chief Executive of uh, North and East, uh, and Ian, um, heading up adult social care at the council. And I think that stood us in really good stead, um, having that, that uh, joint executive decision making across health and social care. Uh, David Evans um, uh, from uh, Cephas Hearts uh, CCG uh, has, has stood down, and I'm sure we'll be seeing him uh, in future. Uh, presenting papers from, from that direction, and Nick Carver, Chief Executive of um, uh, North Hearts Hospital Trust, and of course that's QE2 and Lister Hospital, but also oversight of um, our cancer services at, help me out, uh, over the border in Clingdon. Um, they have been, made a huge contribution, I'm grateful for that. And, and one sort of not final announcement, but um, um, Ian McBeath. Ian McBeath, after seven years of chief executive, sorry, of, of, of uh, heading up adult social care in Hertfordshire, uh, is leaving us. He is moving on uh, to head up adult social care and all sorts of other things up in Bradford. And we wish him well with his move. And I just wonder um, if we could say a few words. I have indicated that Sarah and Nicholas might like to say a few words to thank Ian, as this will be his last Health and Wellbeing Board uh, attending. Um, and Sarah, would that be OK to call upon you first? Hi, yes, Ian, um, on behalf of the whole uh, 
VCSE, Voluntary Community and Social and Enterprise Sector. I'd just like to say a huge thank you for everything that you have done for Hertfordshire over these past years. You have been an exceptional leader, um, a person who is really courageous and is really genuine, and above all, really, really has cared for the people that we are all serving. Um, that's been incredibly obvious to us all and just wanted to extend you our sincere gratitude. Thank you and all the very best. Thank you, Sarah. Heartfelt words. Um, Nicholas, did you want to say something? Yes, Ian. I just also wanted to say an, an enormous thank you uh, in terms of the contribution you've made to that joint working between health and uh, local government, adult social care services. Um, it's been truly remarkable, some of the, the joint working that we've been doing uh, over the last few years. And I think we're all going to really miss uh, your, your humour uh, your, uh, you know, your can-do attitude, uh, and I just would like to also thank you on behalf of everybody for the joint work that you did with Beverly over the last year and a bit, which I think was an enormous ask of, of you. Uh, and we're we're we just really wish you all the very best uh, when you move to your new post in Bradford. Thank you, Nicholas. And can I invite? Is there anybody else wanted to say anything? I don't. We don't need perhaps a. Uh, 20 eulogies, but uh, uh, but one or two, if, if you'd like. Hi, Richard, it's Tom Cahill. Please, Tom. Uh, Ian, um, uh, I echo everything Sarah and um, Nicholas has said. Uh, you've been a stalwart, particularly for mental health and learning disability, uh, people in Hertfordshire. Uh, we're sorry to see you go, um, but you leave a great legacy. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, Richard. It's Prague. Please uh, go ahead, Prague. I, I also wanted to say thank you very much, uh, Ian. It was a pleasure working with you. And I think uh, together, together with Beverly, you guys have moved our ICS a lot further than we would have been. And thank you for that. And we, I wish you good luck in your new job. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Prague. I, I see Paul is there. Would you like to say something, Paul? Yes, just very briefly, because I think um, what everyone else has said is absolutely spot on. Uh, Ian, I think you've been an absolute star in the work that you have done for uh, our Sustainability and Transformation Partnership. Uh, it's been a great pleasure working with you. Um, Hertfordshire's loss is definitely Bradford's gain. Uh, and I think that uh, social care uh, will miss you in Hertfordshire. I think that your leadership in social care has been part of the reason this area has had such a good constructive relationship between health and social care over the last few years. So best of luck with the uh, the next exciting step. Thank you, Paul. Um, is there anybody else? No, I think I'll just, I would just say, um, I have other opportunities to thank Ian, um, both at a personal level and through the County Council and others may wish to do so in the future. But I just want to say that um, Ian's warmth humility, understanding, and with me in particular, patience, uh, but sheer insight into tricksy little problems uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, making sure that we're making the right decisions more of the time rather than less of the time. Uh, that is what's going to be missed. Um, and we wish you all the very best, Ian. Um, and you leave a big hole behind. I was going to say, and I've actually written a little note here, don't read this out. But I feel that Hertfordshire has just carved a giant iceberg and it's now heading up north to Bradford. <laughs> um, thank you, Ian. We will move on and we'll get your contribution later on in the meeting. Thank you. Um, I did um, mention earlier that we were going to have a change of order of the agenda. And this is because Jenny Coles has another meeting to attend in her role as president of, uh, of ADASH. Um, and so we'll be taken, um, actually, my apologies. What we'll do first, we'll do some of the, um, the, the, the more boring stuff first. We'll do the minutes first, um, and then certainly not boring, we will get to Ron Tyndall's question. So minutes first, which is agenda item one. Um, uh, colleagues, are you, um, please indicate in the chat if that's okay, uh, but uh, only briefly. Um, are you okay with the accuracy of the minutes from last January? 
Uh, and is there anything you wish to raise from uh, on the minutes? Uh, just before you, and while you're doing that, I would just say that what I did pick up was a couple of items there that I think we would like to see in the autumn, one of which is the safeguarding of vulnerable teenagers. Uh, and I think I leave that with Jenny Coles, and she may wish to briefly comment as part of, um, of her presentation. OK, those are going through fine. Thank you very much. Um, so I will at some point uh, I will get back to uh, to County Hall and somebody will put a big book under my uh, nose and I will sign I will sign those papers. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we now have a um, a public question from uh, Ron Tyndall, who is the uh, opposition spokesman for the Liberal Democrats, County Councillor uh, in Hemel Hempstead. Um, I will read out the question. And I think, uh, Nicholas, just to give you a heads up, I believe that you are going to give the response. And I will just read out the question now. In the COVID-19 hospital discharge service requirements published on the 19th of March 2020, paragraph 1.3 states, acute and community hospitals must discharge all patients as soon as they are clinically safe to do so. Did the hospital trusts and the clinical commissioning groups take the phrase clinically safe to mean that all patients should be COVID-19 tested prior to discharge, and if so, was said testing carried out? If not, will the hospital trusts and clinical commissioning groups explain what they considered the phrase clinically safe to mean, and also state what government guidance on this matter was received? Further, when discharging patients into care homes, did the hospital trusts and clinical commissioning groups take any steps to ensure that the receiving care homes had the appropriate personal protective equipment and COVID-19 guidance. And Ron, after the uh, answer from Nicholas, uh, you're entitled to a supplementary question. So Nicholas, are, are you there? I I am, and I'm uh, now I'm just about to uh, read out the, the statement. Um, so I'd just like to preface this statement by saying that every single death in a care home setting is absolutely tragic for those that are involved in yeah. that, be it the relatives. Uh, and as a, a GP, as a clinician, my heartfelt sympathy goes out to all of those that have lost relatives in such a, a tragic way. Um, I'll Clinical commissioning groups in the acute hospitals continually strive to deliver the best possible patient care. The pandemic has placed unprecedented challenges on the health and care system, not least for those individuals affected by the virus, but also our hardworking staff. Throughout this pandemic, we have always sought and followed national guidance on how to effectively respond to the many challenges we have faced. On the 19th of March 2020, National Guidance on Hospital Discharges was published that set out clear instructions to deliver the necessary hospital capacity to support the anticipated surge in COVID-19 admissions. The guidance was clear that not only those patients presenting symptoms of COVID-19 required a test prior to discharge, the guidance specifically asked health and care partners to urgently discharge all hospitals in patients who were, or, and inpatients who were medically fit to leave hospital and for the CCGs to work with their local authority partners to commission an additional out-of-hospital care and support capacity in particular to facilitate the step down of patients from secondary care in order to free up acute beds. No patient is discharged from an acute setting unless it is clinically safe to do so. This means that clinical staff use their professional judgment to determine if a patient has met their individual medically fit for discharge milestone and therefore no longer requires to stay within the acute care setting. The person may still need support, nursing and or social care or rehabilitation, but this does not require a further stay in hospital and their needs can be met in another health or social care setting, such as a community hospital, care home or their own home with support. From the 19th of March to the 15th of April, when the National Guidance on Discharges outlined in the Social Care Action Plan was issued, 181 people were discharged from Watford General and Lister Hospital into care homes. 
Of those, 46 were tested in keeping with national guidance as they were presenting symptoms of the virus. 23 were tested negative and were discharged to a care home setting and a further 23 were tested positive and were discharged to either a community hospital setting or a care home that had the capacity and infection con uh, control prevention and control systems in place to accept COVID positive patients. For the 135 patients not presenting systems and in keeping with national guidelines, they were discharged into a care home setting without receiving a test for COVID-19. As more understanding and evidence of this virus emerged, this approach changed when guidance to the National Audit Social Care Action Plan was published on the 15th of April. This guidance instructed all patients discharged to a care home were to be tested for the virus and for the result to be known. However, in a small number of cases, the guidance allowed for some discharges to be made without the test result known if in clear isolation and infection prevention control measures were followed in the care home. However, in Hertfordshire, in consultation with the County Council and Public Health, we adopted the position that no patients were to be discharged into care homes without a result being known. The decision was taken to limit the risk of onward transmission. Throughout the pandemic, the acute hospitals, CCGs, alongside the County Council and Public Health have worked together to establish multi-agency cells to support care home staff and residents. These cells exist to support care homes as outbreaks of the virus have been reported, as well as supporting care homes to access the necessary PPE supplies, access training on infection prevention control, staff and recruitment issues, access government funding and to digest the steady stream of national advice to mitigate the impact of this pandemic. In a joint statement from Sean Elton and David Evans, Managing Directors of Eastern Northwest and West Hertfordshire Clinical Commissioning Groups respectively, they say, we have worked hard across the health and care system to understand and implement national guidelines and where we believe appropriate have gone further to support our most vulnerable patients leaving hospital. We are continually learning of, our, of how best to deal with this national crisis and our primary focus has always been on patient safety and their well-being. As soon as the guidance changed on testing requirements and as testing capacity became more available, we have put the necessary measures in place. We were very pleased that staff from the acute hospitals and the CCGs responded swiftly to a call for additional specialist resources to support care homes with infection prevention controls training. Our staff have trained staff in care homes across the county to improve their knowledge and confidence in infection control to enhance the safe management residents and staff well-being alongside access to the necessary supplies and their ability to com competently use PPE in care homes. And that's the end of the statement. I just want to add one final thing. I know it's a very long statement, but I think it is um, uh, notable that um, uh, every death is regrettable, but we are, if you like, in the middle of the pack in terms of where, you know, the performance. So, of course, you know, we always want to be the very best, um, but but I think we must also remember and note that the, the you know the number of unexpected deaths across uh, Hertfordshire was one it was very very high compared to um, other parts of the country, particularly in the eastern region. Uh, and the the pandemic actually really severely affected Northwest London. This went into um, particularly Hertfordshire very early on in in March during lockdown. Uh, and I think we must just remember that in the context of this uh, answer. So I hope that's clear, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for that. And I think um, uh, I'm very happy to be corrected, but I think we are not we are not an outlier, uh, outlier in the country. Um, the pandemic did come from London through Hertfordshire very quickly. Um, and uh, it looks like we're about 75th out of 139 upper tier authorities in describing uh, the impact on our care homes. And I just echo your words um, of, of uh, sympathy uh, with all those who have lost their lives. Uh, it has been a grim time, um, but the peak passed some time ago. And as I understand it at the moment, numbers are very, very low indeed. Uh, Ron, could I invite you to ask a supplementary and thank you for your question, because I think that's really helpful uh, in informing us prior to um, 
going into the COVID debate, which we will have after Jenny Coles has presented her paper, but to you for a supplementary. Now, Ron, you look, you're a bit frozen there. Um, okay, I'll tell you what we will do. Uh, Ron, you might, if you can still hear me, I think you may need to go out and come back in again. I think what we will do is we will move to um, agenda item three, which was agenda item five, and Jenny Coles, I wonder if you could present your report on the impact of COVID-19 on children, young people and their families. Um, uh, because I think this is, um, without a doubt, uh, this has been a concern uh, by a lot of people for a long time now. And, and I think it's really, it's really apposite that you should be with us to be able to present your report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, quite rightly, as it says at the beginning of, our, of this report, uh, the focus over the last few months and in the pandemic has been on adult health. However, um, we know that the impact on children, certainly in the medium and long term, may well be um, equally as great. And this report uh, highlights key areas, not only work that's been done in terms of adapting um, to, to the restrictions that have had to be put in place, but also highlights some of the concerns around um, the impact of services not operating uh, as they have done, as they do usually. Um, we wanted to put this on the agenda of the Health and Wellbeing Board a partnership and, um, and the integrated care system to ensure that priority continues to be given to children and young people in the allocation of resources and services. And this, um, in a way, is quite challenging because what we anticipate is, is that that need that's been supp suppressed because of restrictions will take some time to emerge um, and may well not do until the autumn when we see schools reopening to far more pupils. Um, what the report does is show a really good partnership response and that adaption of services across education settings, safeguarding and prevention services, emotional health and well-being and health services. However, um, as the College of Paediatricians wrote to the government last week, the real concerns about child health in its, in its greatest form with children missing health appointments, the impact on their mental health and well-being, um, and not being able to go to school every day, um, may well have those long lasting mm. implications that mm. the report details. Mm. So I'm not intending to go into the report in any more detail. You have it there and very willing to answer questions. Also, we have Marion Ingram, who's the author of the report, is also here. And I know Theresa Heritage um, would like to, um, to say, um, say a few words and also um, pick up any questions. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Jenny. And Marion, thank you for your report. It's comprehensive and helps us to uh, to introduce this topic. Um, colleagues, I, uh, I will be looking to to pick up those that would wish to to speak in the um, uh, in the chat. That's lovely. If I could ask Paul to go first. Thank you very much. And a very helpful report. Um, I just wanted to um, ask a couple of questions and offer a reflection, which I think has applicability to the other discussions that will come up later around the impacts of COVID. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the um, psychosocial impacts that both the pandemic is having and indeed the sort of cascade of compounding risks uh, that will flow from the uh, recession that is now uh, inevitably uh, following in the wake of the pandemic. Um, clearly that has an impact on families and in turn has an impact on children. Um, and overlaid on that are the uh, significant issues around uh, disadvantage and the sort of fault lines that the pandemic has made even clearer in, in our society. So I guess I would be interested to know uh, what analysis has been done to uh, better understand those parts of our population who have been most 
exposed to uh, the, the negative effects that have just been described. And uh, really just suggest that uh, clearly there is a service response to this, but there is also a whole society response required, which means engaging with civil society organisations, our community and voluntary sectors, uh, as well as obviously uh, the, the role that our integrated care system can play. Um, so I'm hoping that as part of the discussions today, we, we will be able to find ways in which we can, can work differently and also support those civil society organisations, support families and support children. Thank you, Paul. Jenny, would you like to comment? Yes, certainly. And I think um, and some positives that have come out of the last few months are the way communities have really mobilised and supported each other and the massive amount of volunteers that came forward um, to support particularly the SHIELD operation. And so if we can galvanise that in a different way to support families, I think that would be really positive. Um, in terms of the data analysis, um, public health colleagues, Jim, have started doing that, haven't they? Um, and uh, and there um, is a presentation that is um, that that was presented last week to the Children's Commissioning Executive, which is the first steps of that, and we can circulate that. So, Jim, I don't know whether you might want to comment on the work that's been um, being done um, around that. Um, yes, happy to come in there. I think there's several things that we're doing in public health. We're currently doing the kind of short term uh, analyses of where we need to go for recovery. And we've been feeding into the recovery cell and various other groups about priorities. Um, I think there will be more work that we need to do. Um, partly uh, that will be about um, advice, but also partly there'll be some analysis. I think we do need to look at taking a a kind of health inequalities approach um, because of the economic impact uh, and doing as much as we can to uh, address the kind of wider determinants and the things that might cause health problems um, such as you know employment so a good growth strategy for Hertfordshire is every bit as much a health intervention going forward yeah. out of this pandemic um, as a public mental health strategy I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, uh, uh, Terry would like to come in and then Tim. Terry Heritage. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I just wanted to make a few comments, if I might, just to um, elaborate on a few points. Um, obviously, we, we are all concerned um, about um, all children and young people and um, no, no least at uh, those young adolescents who are finding themselves not actually sitting exams. Who would have ever thought that it, it would impact upon a young person that they didn't have to do an exam? Um, but it is, and it is, and it's making them worried and they're waiting for their results. Equally, those people, young people who are leaving university are, um, are concerned because they don't know if they're going to have jobs to come to. So, I mean, part of the work that we've been doing around the um, more adolescent end, as it were, um, is YC Hearts have been working with young people um, who um, perhaps have, have been more, um, who are seen as more vulnerable, but equally uh, the LEP and the economic strand of Hertfordshire are, are still looking at um, how we can introduce more apprenticeships and make those more freely available. So I think it's important to remember when looking at children and young people that across Hertfordshire, I'm very pleased to say that we can say um, in mental health terms and uh, public health terms, it's a whole system approach, which is what Jim's uh, uh, referring to. Every single partner in Hertfordshire has a part to play in the well-being of every child and young person. And I think going forward in recovery, it will be very important for us to make sure that we engage with every strand of partnership, including the charitable sector. Um, and that's really gonna be more in recovery because they um, have a, such a lot to offer um, in those areas that perhaps public services can't. So um, just, just as a, also just a couple more things, if I may. Um, YC Hearts is actually doing um, the children's service is doing some mapping around what's going on, what's being offered for young people over the summer holidays. We're mapping that if we can. Um, YC Hearts is providing some projects um, for the vulnerable young people, 
and um, also YC Hearts is um, doing another survey. We did our first survey of all young people in Hertfordshire. Oh gosh, seems like years ago now, but it's back last year. Um, about what were their what were their challenges? What were their biggest concerns? Out of that came climate change, um, but also mental health. So that um, YC Hearts are now going back producing another survey. Um, which I think is being launched in the next couple of days to young people and set asking, how, is, how has the pandemic affected you? And that's going to be quite a few age groups. So we're listening to the young per people's voice. So we're doing quite a lot there already. Happy to, to tell you lots more. OK, thank, thank you, Terry. I think, uh, Jenny, I'll ask Tim to, to comment or ask questions and then perhaps you come back. Thank you, Tim. Yes, thank you, uh, Richard. I, I just wanted to, actually to, to, to endorse what, what Terry's just said uh, and Jim prior to that. Um, you know, these are, these are serious issues which we need to take on board. And, and I think to some extent we're already doing so. Um, Jim and I, together with colleagues from education two or three weeks ago, did a webinar and there's over a thousand young people dialed into it. Um, and uh, a lot of their comments reflect what we're talking about now. So. Certainly, we're taking that on board and using some of our existing vehicles, such as Just Talk, to, to deal with it. Uh, but I think overall, Paul raises a, some really important issues, which, which came out of the, the WHO research, as, as he said. Um, and Jim and I actually discussed that this morning. And what we plan to do is, is um, get our beha uh, behavioural science team to have a look at this, um, to perhaps do some sort of audit on what we're already doing to identify the gaps, um, uh, looking at what we're already doing to see whether we can scale that up, to look to look at the gaps so that we can fill them in uh, and we'll find some resource to do that. So um, perhaps it's more appropriate to talk about that in more detail later, but uh, we're certainly taking very seriously the points that have been raised. Yeah, well, thank you, Tim. And could I just add, Jenny, presumably, um, actually, I tell you what, you, if you could uh, comment back on um, Terry and uh, and. Tim, and then I'll bring in Steve. Yes, in, in terms of um, Tim, that was what I was referring to in, ter in, um, in terms of doing data analysis, and I think is a really good opportunity to do that now, and it's very much needed. Um, and, um, and Terry went through through the range of things, which it's not just children's services, we are linking with our partners, um, you know, health providers and schools in terms of gathering information about what young people actually say. And I know um, that's been done in terms of emotional health and wellbeing services and Tom um, in terms of HPFT. Uh, it's very easy in all this um, to move away from what our record is in terms of making that the young people's voice is at the centre of this. So we're going to make a real effort on that over the summer. Um, did you want me to pick up on the adult safe, um, adolescent safeguarding, Richard, as well? Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank through. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the report does does um, summarise some of the work that's been doing, going on, but I want to reassure people that the Hertfordshire Safeguarding Children Partnership has been regularly putting out um, in social media and various ways where um, people can get help. Our services um, have continued to do face to face where that has been safe to do so. Um, and we use our full range of young people services to to get out and, um, and make um, contact with young people who may be out in parks or around in, and making sure there's social distancing in that. Our adolescent safeguarding team continues to operate in a variety of ways virtually um, and also face to face when that is safe to do so. And um, if um, if people do have any concerns, then they should look on on the website, Hertfordshire website, because that will tell them where they can get help and report any concerns about um, any child. Thanks, Jenny. And I suppose echoing uh, what you've just been uh, talking about uh, and uh, Theresa as well, I was delighted. I think it was in uh, April, May that I got a little uh, message to say that the, the YC advisors were uh, ringing our, our uh, uh, young people up and, and making sure they're OK. And that's that's great news. That's that, that's very good. I'll pick something else up after Steve uh, has asked his question or made his comment. Steve. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to ask a question about the importance of like the first day back at school, because it's always quite a traumatic time for people going to school for the first time or people going to transiting up to a secondary school. So I guess this time it's going to be 
very different and even much worse in terms of trauma for lost people. And with any special arrangements, special thought gone into that particular area? Um, yes, there certainly has. And that will be the same and even more so for September. And um, we're already beginning our planning for September and we're anticipating the government guidance to come out around on that by the end of this month. That's been that's been the promise you've got in this pack. Um, just an example yeah. of the work that's been done by the Educational Psychology Service, which I think is really excellent, has had really good feedback from from um, uh, school settings. Um, and also um, our colleagues, in t um, as, as, as people may be aware, we have a really good offer developing around mental health teams and schools. We've just got the funding for a third wave and uh, we're finding um, ways of um, those teams are finding ways that continue to operate um, on a virtual basis uh, and um, will support the whole brain range of pupils and anxieties but there will be gaps in terms of um, potentially um, far more need than we had before the pandemic and so we need to monitor that very carefully. Thank you Steve, thank you Jenny. Uh, my thought on this must be um, that the major concern presumably is with uh, families who may be struggling where children may be vulnerable, where we haven't been able to get social workers to those families during uh, during the lockdown period. And presumably um, for, for you, the understanding of, of how things have gone during uh, the, uh, uh, the early part of this pandemic, um, you, will, you will get a better understanding in the next month or two or three. And um, I, 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 how, how, do, how, do you, how do you quantify that concern? And is that a, is that a rate uh, you're expecting a, a, a huge amount of activity in the next two or three months? Well, first of all, in terms of um, uh, families that are known to children's social care, those families have been seen and they're increasingly we're going out and doing face to face and we monitor. We have data on that on a weekly basis, so we monitor all that. But they've used a variety of methods, as said here, and, and families actually have really responded well to to a virtual um, approach as well as as face to face. But we are doing that modelling, yes. And um, just to give um, colleagues an awareness in terms of just children's social care, that our referrals are now more or less at. Um, at some um, pre-pandemic levels, but we've only got a small percentage of pupils in school. So if we're yeah. at the Understand. stage we were at at the beginning of March, then we anticipate that the um, that the pressure of need will certainly be um, more than it is now, and will come through in every stages of that of um, that um, support continuum. And I know our colleagues in um, the police and health services expect the same. So we're monitoring that, we're doing that modelling and we're monitoring it very, very closely. Um, we anticipate that probably in the autumn we will expect um, an increase in families asking for help. Jenny, that's really helpful. That's um, that's just what we want to hear, actually, that you're, uh, you're able to get out and about now and to make contact with our most vulnerable children and our most vulnerable families and that they are being supported. But of course, the schools are the eyes and ears and the support for families families as well and that's been absent for a while. Um, I wish you well in your in your work and I think it might be useful um, if you probably come back in the autumn we may be in a slightly different format uh, to let us know when you're giving a, a report on adolescence about younger children as well and, and safeguarding issues and just uh, uh, keep the board appraised. I think the board during recovery phase uh, would want um, to know that children's services are the very and, and the support for children uh, within the community is at the very heart of what uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, will, will want to pursue. And of course, I think it was last year that we made um, the mental health of young people an absolute top priority for the Health and Wellbeing Board. And of course, that's going to be uh, echoed um, uh, uh, many times over. Um, can I thank you and Marion for your report? Um, I, there's no further colleagues indicating they wish to speak. Um, can we note the report and um, wish Children's okay. Services... Um, somebody's coming in? So Richard, can I just ask one question of Shika. health if I might? Sorry. Please um, come in. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
one of, one of the challenges that we have had in relation to health visitors and um, therapists is that um, they have obviously had to be seconded to other parts of the NHS um, because I believe the NHS, um, that's how it works when, when it was in level four. Um, I appreciate now the country's moved to level three on, on the pandemic and I just wondered whether anybody was able to indicate to me um, when we might expect um, health visitors to be back fully into work and also when the therapies for children are going to be reintroduced because actually it's quite it's quite a, um, an impact on children not being able to have speech and language for instance over the last three four months um sorry i, I meant to ask that earlier on thank you jenny um, I don't think that was a question for me, and I think okay. Claire, Claire Hawkins has... Uh, okay, that's why I called it. Claire, could you pick up? And Claire's Thank raised you. her hands as well. Morning. Hello, Claire here. Thank you. Yes, um, really, really important point, and you're right that we had to follow national guidance, which meant that we did redeploy about 45% of our children and young people's public health nursing teams in our trust um, and the majority of those staff actually were redeployed in in our own trust but we did support the other health providers across the system and I think you know a lot of recognition needs to be given to our health visiting um, and school nursing teams for um, what for some people was really quite an anxious period where they were moved in to provide other services to support the overall response from health. Um, and I think they've done that absolutely admirably. And there's a huge amount of learning, actually, that's come from this about um, how we can all provide much more integrated services. Um, in direct answer to your question, um, we are, like all providers at the moment, working on our recovery plans. And we've already started to move uh, our redeployed staff back into their usual substantive roles. And we have an intention that the majority of those uh, public health nursing service staff will be back in their usual roles um, over the course of July through to September. Of course, what we do also have to do is be ready if we have any further increase in um, the pandemic to be able to quickly move people around again in order to ensure that we can make the right response. But certainly over the course of the summer, we're moving people back um, and I've written to Jim to update him further about that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much. And to Jenny and to uh, Teresa. Um, can I, can I, the, the partnership and very close working, you called it integrated working, Claire, can I welcome that and hope that during the recovery phase that we hang on to as much of that place working as we possibly can. And I'm sure we may want to pick up some of that thought when we discuss COVID uh, in, in, the, in the next two items. Um, very grateful indeed for that contribution, Claire. Thank you. Um, and, to, and to your staff for what they've been, uh, sort of how they've been supporting during the pandemic. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Um, colleagues, I, I uh, I, I'm sure we will, but uh, could we, if we just do the chat uh, function, uh, just uh, note uh, the report and, and uh, if you are supportive or otherwise, if you uh, could make your 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 um, uh, thoughts known in the usual way, agree, disagree or abstain. Um, and just noted that's that's great. Thank you, Jenny. Really appreciate it. And uh, I hope we've got you 10 to 11. You have 10 minutes before your next appointment, which presumably is in the same room in the same <laughs> chair. Thank you very much. It is. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would now like us to, I think Ron has rejoined the meeting and it seems only appropriate that we should allow him to ask uh, his supplementary question. So, Ron, are you with us? And Thank are you able to ask your supplementary? I lost you halfway through your your additional comment, and I apologise for that. I don't know what went on. And, and anyway, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Nicholas for his comprehensive response, for which I'm grateful. Uh, I do not have a supplementary question, but just would like to join my colleagues to the expressions of sympathy for all those and their families affected by COVID-19 
And I would also like to express our special appreciation to the NHS and care staff for their dedication. And finally, I wish to join the sentiments expressed about the loss of, uh, of the uh, use of Ian McBeath, who's joining uh, Bradford and leaving us soon. And, and, but thank you very much. And I look forward to having a written report, a written copy of it so that I can uh, look at the, some of the details. I've got the, the essentials, but uh, I was impressed by Nicholas and the way he covered everything properly. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those words, Ron. That's really, that's really helpful. And in, and in the spirit of all of us working together through this pandemic, uh, we have lost a lot of people uh, in Hertfordshire. Uh, we've lost over 500 from our, our, our care homes and our, our deeper sympathies go to families and in the way that you have expressed it. Thank you very much. Um, we now um, go to agenda item four, which was agenda item three which is a COVID-19 situation update um, before we go into I, the next item, which will be our response to COVID. So the next two items are both on COVID. And Jim, if you'd like to kick us off, please. And I believe that you also have a presentation. Um, yes, thank you, Richard. Can everybody see that? Yeah, uh, we can see that. Yeah. That's coming through clear. Thank you. Great. If you could make it a bit smaller, Jim, that'd be great. Oh, that's fab. Is that Thank better? You. Yeah, that's great, actually. It's good. OK, um, so uh, I'll be fairly brief and this will be necessarily selective because um, if I updated you on everything, we'd be we'd be here for some considerable time. Um, the situation we're in um, now, I can't get the slides to move um, uh, in terms of Hertfordshire is that we are coming down from the first peak. Uh, we're by no means uh, over the first wave. There are still new cases, but they are declining and the doubling rates, the, the, the rate at which the infection doubles, um, has now moved to a halving rate, if you like, of about 11 days. So um, cases are declining. We've had 2,964 cases to date. The rate of increase has slowed. The daily assessment calls for NHS 1-1 has gone down from a peak of about two and a half thousand a day to around 200 a day, which gives you a, a sense of the change of um, demand. Um, very sadly, we have had 917 deaths um, across all situations um, registered so far uh, in Hertfordshire. Um, we, we've already discussed the kind of death rates, um, but what we do know is that um, our death rates have so far followed the national pattern of people with pre-existing conditions, uh, people being older, few, very few young people um, dying, but every death is obviously um, a tragedy. Um, we believe that about 0.2 and 0.7 percent of the population currently may be expressing symptoms, so that might be around 8,400 people. So by no means everybody in Hertfordshire has been infected and the same with the rest of the country. Um, and just to give you an example, we've delivered over 100,000 food parcels through Operation Shield and Sustain, um, people like Helen Maniff, and 10,000 medical parcels. Um, uh, it, if I enumerated everything that we've done in Hertfordshire on this, there would be a great litany. Uh, and as Claire said, um, a number of services, including from public health, our sexual health and uh, public health nursing services, um, contributed to the COVID effort, and we're now looking at switching those services back on fully. Um, in terms of the, the R number, which everyone's obsessed about, um, I do want to say that it is not the only indicator. We need to look not only at this number, but we need to look at things like the dispersion of infection, the numbers of cases coming through, the locations of infections and a range of things. And um, the public health uh, epidemiology team do that on a weekly basis and provide regular updates. And what this graph shows is the is the R number from uh, February, where you can see it was way up at four and then it's been declining. We think currently the R number for Hertfordshire in the east of England is between 0.7 and 0.9. 
Uh, so that means we're we're not out of the woods yet. We do still have to be cautious. Um, we do still have to take the right measures to control the spread of infection. The virus is still circulating in the community. But as you can see, we're not having the the significant daily ramp up of numbers that we were having. The, the, the virus is declining, but still around. Um, so that's uh, cause for some good news, but we're not out of the woods yet. And in terms of pandemic milestones, um, we don't know if we will have a second peak. Uh, we may, we may not. We may have a, a flare up of the first wave before then. This is um, the kind of wave bit of epidemic science is, is not an exact science. It's a bit of an art in some ways. So we don't know if we'll have a second peak. It is possible. And what we have to do is plan um, in case that should happen but do everything we can to stop it happen, happening. That's where we are currently. So um, I think we're uh, at the end of um, the first wave or first peak, trying to regain some control and stop a second peak. People talk about herd immunity in terms of being a deliberate strategy. I, I'm not going to comment on that. I want to talk about population immunity being reached as it is with any disease um uh eventually which uh, goes pandemic and say we are some considerable way off that um we need 65 to 75 percent of the people of the uk to have been infected before we get there we are nowhere near that as yet uh, and that will continue to be some time so relying on that as a strategy to control this virus is something we have never done in Hertfordshire um Similarly, uh, I think the earliest we will get a vaccine widely available. Uh, I could be wrong because there are candidates, there are about 130 candidates being tested, will be um, the end of this financial year. Uh, so we are moving into the long haul of trying to control this virus. Um, and that brings me to uh, a few points about where we go next. Um, I'm just going to mention the public health contribution in terms of what we've done, but equally I could spend a great deal of time talking about what the NHS or, or adult care or others have done. Um, uh, and this is in no way attempting to detract from what others have done, but um, Ed very kindly mentioned in the report he drafted some of the things we've been doing. So in public health we've focused on um, three main blocks. One has been resourcing work, so we've provided project management for various work streams, um, funding, we've commissioned extra services. We didn't turn all children's public health services off or all sexual health services off. We moved many of them online and kept urgent services going. We provided clinical capacity, um, so as clear says about half of the clinical capacity that Public Health Commission for Public Health Nursing went into the COVID effort and, and I think we have to thank our NHS partners and providers and our voluntary sector partners and providers not only for keeping essential services going but for actually supporting COVID during this. And we coordinated a number of programmes. The second trying to work was expertise, so um, communications messages design, campaign design, outbreak management work, public health and guidance. Um, we stood up a helpline for schools uh, in Hertfordshire working with children's services and in fact our helpline was stood up before the national helpline. Um, so we have been uh, providing guidance on how to manage spread of infection all the way through and we're now moving uh, to ramp up the guidance on how we do that as we come out of the first peak and into epidemic control. And then in terms of intelligence, we've been providing epidemiological surveillance and modelling in terms of the need for beds, in terms of testing, in terms of impact on um, the population and on the system and obviously sadly the numbers of deaths. And we'll continue to do that. But while many other services are moving to recovery, public health will need to keep going with some of this pandemic work for some considerable time for the reasons I've mentioned. Now, I think our priorities, I think as a system going forward, I'd like to suggest 
aside from recovery, um, need to be um, getting our outbreak plan up and ready, and we have until the end of this month to do that. Um, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, so that we continue to manage um, the infection downwards while obviously preparing in case we do get a second wave. The next thing I think has to be the impact of COVID on populations, which Paul and Tim discussed earlier, um, and particularly the impact in terms of health inequalities across the board. Um, and I won't say more about that because we discussed that earlier, but there is work to be done and ensuring that service delivery can pick up. One of the conversations that Sarah Wren and I had, for example, was that there will be a large number of older people who may experience muscle wasting or loneliness as a result of having shielded. And how do we make sure that the impact of the non-COVID impact on their health of shielding is effectively addressed and mitigated? That's going to be a priority for us. In terms of local outbreak plans, government asked us on the 22nd of May to produce and publish a local outbreak plan by the 30th of June. Um, so no pressure. Um, and uh, there are seven themes to that plan. Um, ensuring that we address infection in care homes and schools, where well, we already have plans in place for those. That we assess uh, places, locations and communities that are at high risk of spread of the virus um, and we are in the middle of doing that as we speak. The third is that we ramp up local testing capacity and can deploy testing where we need it to. Really pleased to say working with NHS colleagues um, and military colleagues, um, we really have increased the testing capacity in Hertfordshire by some way and will continue to do that. The work of contact tracing in complex settings um, so that we stand up plans to ensure we can contact trace people. Um, we already have some of that in place and we will have the rest in place by the 30th of June. Data integration so that we can um, proactively identify um, rising tides of infection in Hertfordshire as well as outbreaks and act um, urgently. Um, addressing the needs of people who are more vulnerable to the impact of COVID. And so there's work there for primary care to do, but there's work there for all our services. I talked about the work um, that Hills had identified, but there is also work around BAME populations, for example, um, people with learning disabilities and a variety of other populations I won't go into detail on. And seventh, having a local outbreak board, which is an officer led board and a local member board, which um, is a board which will be chaired by David Williams the leader of Hearts County Council with all of the leaders of Hertfordshire Councils and the Police and Crime Commissioner and Tim Hutchins will be the deputy chair. So those arrangements are being stood up as we speak to make sure that for as long as this virus is around, um, we have uh, arrangements to um, manage the outbreak. A, a brief word about what works in stopping COVID. We don't have a vaccine yet. We don't have widely available effective antivirals yet. So we are down to um, three long established tools in public health. Um, the first is those kind of non uh, pharmacological or non drug interventions like hygiene, cleaning, infection, physical distancing. Those things undoubtedly had a major impact in reducing infection and we need to continue them otherwise we will see infections ramp up again. This virus is still around. Um, the second is testing, isolating and contact tracing. There is no doubt that has to be a significant plank going forward. Uh, and the third is case finding, which is where, for example, we may be more proactive and we've already been doing this in some settings where we find one person positive, so we test everybody in the whole setting um, and get in early. That's a particularly useful tool that um, we have found useful here locally. Um, we're going to have five themes in our outbreak plan. There will be prevent and respond that will cover, um, among other things, vulnerable people, care homes, schools, high risk places. Some of the work we've done uh, on public transport and town centres and workplaces, the toolkit we did for businesses on how to reopen safely, that all fits in there. Uh, and I think the rest are fairly um, self-explanatory. 
including a, a program management office to make sure this all works effectively together. This is a large scale operation, but we are used to managing outbreaks in Hertfordshire because we're a big area um, and we are used to outbreaks and look backs. So um, we will rise to this challenge and get that plan published. Um, another word about the levels of outbreak incidents. So um, we are well used to dealing with different types of outbreaks. Um, I won't go into detail, but I think we've come to a conclusion that we will have four waves of outbreaks. The first will be things we can manage within existing capacity. The second will be things that um, exceed the outbreak management capacity, but are well within the capacity of the strategic coordinating group of the local resilience forum and the agencies and the board together. A major peak of infection um, requiring a full response would be level three and level four would be a second wave. We need to plan for a second wave while doing everything we can to prevent it. And that's why we need these levels. And there will be a daily um, epidemiological monitoring meeting and surveillance report on where we are in this. A quick word about track and trace and local outbreak plans. Um, they are two very different but overlapping programmes. Track and Trace is a national programme run by the NHS, which has contact tracers at national and regional level and will hand to local level complex contact tracing that it can't do understandably because of the complexity of that. Local outbreak plans are our local plans to address outbreaks in communities um, and actually work on situations, premises and localities. The two together form parts of a jigsaw of how we manage outbreaks. A quick word about the longer term. Um, we know that there already have been psychological impacts, physical health impacts, economic, social and employment impacts. And understanding and acting on these will be needed to address the whole burden of COVID on our population. Um, and the burden of COVID is not just on um, people who've had the virus, but it's on people who have lost their jobs, people who have very sadly lost their lives, um, people who are now afraid of uh, going back to work or going back to school, which is one of the reasons we absolutely need to crack safer workplaces and safer settings so that people can have confidence that everything that can be done is being done to prevent the spread of this virus in situations and workplaces. And finally, um, just a quick word about mental health. This was uh, a piece of work that was developed by the Hertfordshire Mental Health um, Group with the LGA and the Association of Directors of Public Health, which is a life course look at the impact of COVID uh, on mental health. We're busy doing one on its impact on physical health, and uh, we will also be doing one about whole system impact because that can begin to guide some of the things that we need to do. But we know just, for example, that we will need to do more work on grief. So in summary, uh, we are not out of the woods yet. Um, the infection is ramping down. We need to continue social distancing, physical distancing and hygiene measures and all the things we need that are effective, particularly in situations that are at high risk of spreading infections. Um, we need people to continue to keep faith with these. And uh, we plan to manage outbreaks down while also planning for the worst case scenario, because that is prudent uh, in my view. Uh, I'll stop there, Chair, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim. That's really helpful. It's very comprehensive. Um, uh, um, can I? Can I just, uh, Jim, for for me as a as a as a lay person, in a sense, um, we we seem to have a fairly high uh, R number still in Hertfordshire. You said 0 0.7 to 0 0.9, um, and your your thoughts are are perhaps less emphatic about a second peak. I just wonder if you want to uh, just talk us through a bit briefly, but where 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 do you think? Um, What's, your, what's the what's the, the best guesstimate around where a second peak might happen uh, based on the fact that I think you've said before that generally uh, epidemics have a second peak. 
because I think this must be really important for planning for um, our, our autumn in a sense. Um, I think that uh, if we have a second peak, I think the my best take is there are two potential likely scenarios. Scenario one is that um, the moving or the, the taking off of restrictions means some people abandon them and that causes rapid community spread and it spreads rapidly through settings where uh, such as mass gatherings where that is likely to happen and we ramp up quickly to a second peak. That's one scenario. Um, uh, the, the means of preventing and that would probably be around about October or autumn. And the worst possible scenario could be that the flu and COVID peak at the same time, um, which, which may not happen given the Australian experience. But we have to be aware of that, that that is a big okay. risk because it will overwhelm the NHS and social care. OK, um, the second scenario for a second peak would be the, a kind of a rising groundwater wave, if you like, of the most vulnerable communities being infected. Um, uh, the first wave spread geographically up from London in some respects. The second wave, because the virus is already here, may spread within the population uh, up. Okay. Uh, and that's the second scenario that everybody is facing. Uh, and if you look at Germany, I don't think Germany is heading back for a second wave. Um, uh, and the R number is a bit unreliable because it's it's a four day ruling average over there. Um, uh, but they have seen several major outbreaks that have rapidly in, resulted in a flare up of the first wave. Uh, OK. In okay. terms of the R number being a bit high, I think it's going in the right direction, but it's going to go slowly at this phase because the virus okay. is circulating. So we should still be very careful as your as your point and you've already made that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, uh, I've got uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Cahill would like to come in and then Tim. Sorry, Richard, no, I wasn't coming in. I was just asking for the slides. Uh, excellent presentation, Jim. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, I'll make sure the slides are sent round. Uh, uh, Tim, then uh, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to add anything to what Jim has said. I think his, his presentation was ex extremely comprehensive. Um, but I just wanted to reinforce the message. You know, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, it's vitally important that everybody pursues the strategies of hygiene, washing hands, maintaining reasonable distance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think we can emphasise that too much. Uh, but the comment I wanted to make is um, uh, just to say thank you to actually all our NHS colleagues, to our local government colleagues. Um, I don't think the public will ever be quite aware of the amount of work that's really gone into this uh, and the effort and the sacrifice many of them have made. So uh, thank you to, to all concerned and uh, uh, let's hope we, we can keep on keeping this under control. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, Nicholas. Yes, I, I just wanted to say a, a big thank you to Jim and the team for the clarity of the public health message and the work that you have been doing behind the scenes. It has been truly monumental and uh, I think some of the detailed work that has to go into um, uh, working on, on these and clusters and outbreaks is, is nobody would ever you know, quite understand the breadth and the time involved to, to do that. So that's the first thing I'd like to say. I think the other thing I'd just like to slightly broaden this out so as we move into all the measures that are there to prevent uh, outbreaks um, we are in a position where our hospitals in particular but also other all of our other health and uh, social care providers mm -hmm. are, are slowed down in their ability to do the normal business and I think we probably do you know I, I suppose I'd just like to highlight I know people on the around the board realize this that you know it isn't going to be a quick return to business as usual in terms of the volume of activity that we're able to do so people who are waiting for hip replacements people who are waiting for uh, in investigations uh, that perhaps are non-urgent are, are going to be waiting considerably longer you know, everybody's working behind the scenes to make you know it is as, as quick as possible to get up 
up and running. But, you know, our, our acute hospitals in particular have taken an enormous knock uh, and uh, we're all working, as I said, behind the scenes to try and uh, get back to business. Yes, for, for urgence, for two week waits, we will absolutely prioritise them. But we do need to bring the public along with us in understanding mm -hmm. how how complex this is. Yeah, we are. That. Nicholas, thank you very much. I, I, as uh, whether it's your practice, oh, Nicholas is gone. Uh, whether it is uh, your practice, uh, anybody else's GP practice, the hospitals, uh, and and all of our social and health care uh, that uh, in normal times is relied on uh, going absolutely full steam. Do appreciate that to get back on on track again will will take some doing. Uh, but thank you for that. That's really helpful. That's reassuring to the public to know that they're working so hard to to try and do that. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I suspect, I see no more uh, speakers, I suspect that uh, we will pick up further comments and it will involve yourself, I'm sure, in the next item, uh, which is our response to COVID. Um, so for those of you that are, um, are following these things, um, our COVID, so uh, uh, item five uh, will be our uh, response to COVID and Ed Knowles, uh, is going to take us through this. And Ed, I just wonder, could you introduce yourself, uh, your role, uh, and uh, of course your OPPO, Tom Hennessy, is up in North and East, but if you could just mention uh, your role within, uh, within the health and social care system. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name's Ed Knowles. I'm the Assistant Director for Health Integration, so I work across the County Council uh, and Hearts Valley CCG. Uh, my counterpart, Tom Hennessy, has the same role. He works for the County Council and for East North Hearts CCG. Um, so if you're happy, Chair, I'll go straight into the paper. Thank um, you so much. So this report provides an overview of the partnership activity uh, that has underpinned Hertfordshire's response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and rather than trying to summarise the entirety of the activity across health and social care, it focuses uh, on those interventions and activities that have relied on joint work across partner organisations, most of whom are represented around this table. Uh, the report focuses on seven key areas, which I will go through uh, very briefly. Um, just a reminder, this, this can never be an exhaustive list of all the different ways that our organisations have collaborated and supported one another over the last three months, um, but I think it does highlight the depth of partnership working that we uh, that we have here in Hertfordshire. Um, so board are going to be recommended to note these developments, but I think the more pressing question is how we ensure that this board and these partnerships inform and drive our recovery and response looking ahead. Um, so section four of the report summarises the activity that's taken place to improve uh, and streamline discharge arrangements to support hospital capacity. Um, we've referred to this uh, earlier in this agenda, uh, the government issued specific hospital discharge service requirements um, which suspended patient eligibility, it suspended continuing healthcare assessments uh, and it committed the NHS to fully fund any new or additional out of hospital or prevention and admission packages. Um, so in, in light of that, system partners across Hertfordshire came together um, uh, and uh, as a consequence we've been able to provide at speed more residential care capacity, um, we've temporarily changed the use of NHS community health beds. Um, and invested in a huge amount of multi-agency multi activity to make the process of supporting people safely out of hospital as streamlined as it can be. Um, all this activity and that additional capacity is being reviewed right now um, with many of those working practices I just mentioned likely to be adopted as, as, as part of the new normal going forward. Um, section 5 of the report focuses on activity that took place outside the hospitals, uh, specifically support provided by primary care and our community health trusts. Um, so for example our GPs have developed hot and cold pathways for COVID positive and non-COVID patients, um, as well as a, kind of a massive move towards embracing virtual technology um, uh, for virtual consultations, which I know is also extended into how our GPs are supporting our care homes. So a lot of virtual consultations, but supported by home care, care home staff on the ground, actually be able to help support the uh, observations and some of the other measures required. Um, as Claire mentioned earlier, actually, both of our community health trusts have developed specific pathways. We've got respiratory virtual hospitals, hot hubs, enhanced prevention remission services. And again, as Claire noted, a substantial proportion of those community health staff redeployed um, to better respond to pressures in the system. Um, section six uh, is uh, around our care home response. Uh, I mean, as noted already, we all know that the uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on older people have meant that care homes across the country have been uh, particularly hard hit. Um, we have been able to kind of point to substantial multi-agency support around care homes in Hertfordshire. So uh, the County Council, Hearts Care Providers Association in particular, 
um, the NHS Community Health Trust, the CCGs, a whole range of interventions delivered in partnership and collaboration. Um, there's a list as part of section 6.3, which I, I won't go through. Um, there is uh, also a document published online, um, which is uh, details our entire offer towards uh, um, care home support right now uh, and in the future. I will make a particular reference to the, the um, provider hub that uh, we established uh, very early uh, in the uh, outbreak of the pandemic, which is acted as a kind of a key point of information for that wider care market around the kind of ever shifting and changing advice guidance information of, has obviously developed uh, as the pandemic has progressed. Um, the last one to note on care homes really is alongside all the clinical support and guidance, uh, there is additional support that has gone into just strengthen the sustainability of that care market. And certainly a risk as part of recovery is making sure that sector uh, has the ongoing support, both clinical and financial, to keep it on its feet. Um, Section 7 uh, covers PPE, personal protective equipment, um, which I'm sure all colleagues know there have been periods over the last three months where the availability and supply has been challenging. Um, at the moment, I think it's fair to say that the situation looks better and the Health Economy Tactical Coordinating Group um, uh, has been uh, overseeing all the mutual aid arrangements required to make that um, flow between NHS trusts and ultimately social care. Um, and we do have a multi-agency PPE cell uh, established underneath the Strategic Coordinating Group to make sure that continues looking ahead. Um, Section 8 covers uh, the swabbing and testing activity. Um, which continues to develop, including the uh, introduction uh, of uh, antibody testing for NHS staff, uh, just for planning purposes. Very important to say that. Uh, still no suggestion it confers. There's any kind of uh, immunity conferred by having had the infection, but there are staff now being tested in the NHS with the antibody test as part of uh, wider planning purposes. Um, only a few more to go. Section 9 uh, refers, to, as we've mentioned already, to the psychological and psychosocial impact of the pandemic and specifically points to the work that HPFT have led in terms of providing uh, uh, all the psychological support for health and social care staff across Hertfordshire. Um, and no doubt we'll want to be looking, as kind of Paul Burstow mentioned earlier on, at the, the ongoing impact uh, across our communities. Um, Section 10 is referring to multi-agency activity around how we've supported the shielded community, particularly with our voluntary sector. I won't go into any further detail here because we have a paper next on the agenda around that. Um, so finally, the paper concludes with some considerations around um, Hertfordshire's ongoing response to pan uh, uh, coronavirus and our recovery activity. So uh, the report outlines the key principles uh, that the integrated care system will base its recovery activity on, um, as well as the, the roles that the West Hearts and East Hearts integrated care partnerships and the Mental Health Learn Disability Alliance will play. Um, <clears throat> so finally, the, the paper really asks the board to consider the role of this board going forward. Um, how its work meetings can address issues over and above specific services, how it can provide some democratic transparency, <coughs> sorry, democratic transparency to complement the work of the ICS and the ICP. Uh, and finally, whether you know the role of this board to consider, as Jim mentioned, the disproportionate impact on some communities, um, and certainly how we look to support our um, BAME communities um, uh, as the, the situation progresses. And I'll finish there, Chair. Ed, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, a whistle-stop tour of three months of the most intense activity um, uh, that all of the health and social care sector with a lockdown community. Um, it's new to all of our lifetimes um, and I commend all of you for your contribution uh, to making this um, or minimising the impact of the virus as much as we have done. Um, but there is there is more to do and we we now have to win the recovery um can i can i ask are there those that would like to come in to um uh, make a comment um teresa there we go thanks richard um yeah real whistle stop tour indeed but packed full of information um really useful report um can i first of all start off by um as a result of some personal experiences over the period, I suppose. Can I congratulate, um, in particular, uh, my own uh, GP surgery, which is in Harpenden, um, in relation to virtual appointments? This has been working really, really well. It's really responsive and it does give um, peace of mind quite quickly, actually, to be able to just to speak to a GP. Um, but I, I, I just do wonder 
whether there is consistency, and this is something for the ICS perhaps, or Health and Wellbeing Board, whether there is consistency across Hertfordshire around the use of virtual appointments um, and how one obtains them and how one uses them. So I, I just would like somebody to comment on that. Um, I'd also like to congratulate, um, in my own locality again, community navigators. They've been really useful um, in making sure that the NHS is uh, joined up with the community and local government. We found uh, our particular local one really good, um, especially around um, the isolated and shielding. Um, another question, if I might, please, for the hospital trusts um, and where um, they have been uh, providing um, virtual appointments, um, either for mental health issues or, um, or uh, physical issues, um, and that we're now getting to the stage where all the sort of virtuals have run out and now there's actual one-to-ones needed. There is some concern around whether um, people going into coming off a of virtual into reality, as it were, um, will go to the back of the queue. And I think this is, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't matter, that, that won't happen, but I think it's around communications. And similarly, there is concern from people I hear um, around uh, such things as blood tests. If they're isolated, how can they have blood tests so that they can go on to their next stage of drugs? There's those sort of issues. It's about communications okay. and where they can go. Okay. Thank you. Quite a okay. lot, but thank you. Lovely. Um, there's, there's two or three, um, uh, they're, they're relatively specific, and I think they're quite specific to uh, GP practice. I wonder if Nicholas or Prague would want to pick up on uh, sort of virtual appointments and going back to reality um, and uh, the, uh, <coughs> navigate and how they've been able to operate uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, so yeah, I can uh, talk about the virtual appointments and uh, I think uh, in certainly in my patch uh, most practices uh, doing a triage, uh, are, um, they're all doing a triage model first. So patients phone in for appointments, they go on a triage list and either their problem gets solved or uh, they, they call for a face-to-face -face appointment. And we're also doing video consults and e-consults. And, and I think uh, with the pandemic, this has accelerated the use of all of these uh, technologies, which is good. And, and I think going forward, post-COVID, if there is going to be a post-COVID period, uh, the way we practice uh, will, will change and, and, and hopefully uh, will continue this way, where patients will have easier access in terms of get advice and guidance very early on, and those that actually need face-to-face -face will also get seen much quicker. Very good. Thanks, Prague. Thank you. Nicholas? Yeah, I... I uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. I, so, I echo what Prague has said. I think it's really important that, that our public understand the enormous changes that practices have made in the way that they sort of communicate with with their patients and and I think there is perhaps a slight misunderstanding and I, I, I defer to my acute colleagues and to those in mental health but a virtual appointment can be as good as sometimes better than a, than a, a, a traditional face-to-face -face. I'm not underestimating how important a face-to-face -face appointment can be there are particular instances when we need to see patients uh, and although you know sometimes people may have thought GPs were closed um, in fact you know with adequate PPE and the right precautions we are seeing you know increasing numbers of patients inside our premises but 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 even in acute settings and mental health health the use of virtual appointments is is absolutely vital uh, and will I think help us in the some of the issues I was talking about earlier in terms of getting access to to medical opinions and advice and treatments. So to, to Nicholas just while you're there do you feel uh, that actually uh, primary practice GP practice is more sustainable in its current role of seeing some people face to face and seeing some people on, on, a, on a virtual basis, does it make it feel a, a little less frenetic than it was prior to COVID? 
I would love to have said yes to that, Richard, but the truth of the answer is actually there's a new norm. And I, I think that many of my colleagues would uh, would agree with me, I hope, that the intensity of virtual appointments for the, for the person doing the consulting, be it a nurse or a doctor, is enormous. The concentration you've got to use, uh, and sometimes it does slow things down. You know, setting up a video consultation, you know, we're using software to do that can be can take quite a bit of time um, so yes and no I suppose to that question okay thank you for the insight both of you um, and um, I, I suppose there's one other part to Teresa's uh, question uh, just so that it's answered um, I'll, I'll bring in Christine and perhaps she could uh, uh, pick that up as well uh, Christine you wanted to comment uh, on yeah thank you uh, Richard just to comment on Teresa's point Christine you're sorry you're very quiet you're very quiet. Is that better? Can you hear me oh, now? Oh, that's it. Perfect. Okay. OK, just to comment on uh, Teresa's question about virtual appointments, particularly in hospitals, um, all three of the hospitals have done um, slightly different things, but upon a theme which is to uh, assess patients virtually. And the feedback we've had from patients has been very good. So they they like to have a virtual appointment. Nicholas is absolutely right. It's not suitable for everybody. Some patients absolutely need hands on examination and with the right PPE um, and arrangements, we will make sure that they are seen. Two wait appointments, for example, have continued throughout um, the pandemic. So we've been uh, making sure that those continue. Um, but for the virtual hospital that you heard Ed mention earlier for respiratory patients, particularly a combination of community partners, primary care uh, and consultants have not only been seeing patients virtually but monitoring them um, at a distance um, using SATS probes and, a, and an app to support that. So I think we are learning rapidly about what works and what doesn't and we're now talking with our commissioners and with our partners about um, adopting the things that we um, think work well um, and asking our patients what they think of that um, uh, adapting those things that we have made um, some changes to and we think um, have some merit um, and abandoning those things that we did in the height of the crisis but actually um, we feel are better done face to face or um, through traditional manners. So we're looking at our patient pathways, we are speaking to our patients that have, that have had some experience of that virtual um, clinic or virtual hospital um, and, and we're learning um, based on the feedback that we get from staff and uh, patients. OK, thank you very much. Christine, just while you're there, um, I wonder the, the, the there hasn't been a normal cycle of um, appointments and treatment uh, for the last three months. And yet there's also been a reduction in, in activity of people coming forward. Some of that reduction was what we were hoping to achieve. Um, through through the work of the Health Wellbeing Board by the totality of the health and social care and our voluntary sector and our community leadership so that people felt more confident within their communities and therefore didn't need to go to a GP practice or to hospital. Um, do, you, do you have concerns that post pandemic or post phase one, if you like, that we might have a big rush back? Or do you feel that the Health Wellbeing Board has a role to, to support communities uh, in order to um, uh, mitigate some of that go back to primary care and go back to hospital um, because they feel un, un, unsure or lack of, have a lack of confidence in their health. What's your what's your thoughts on that? Well, as ever, there's a real balance to be struck here. Um, of course, we would always want patients to be treated um, uh, close to their home and to avoid hospital if they possibly can. And we have certainly seen some of that um, through the last few months. Um, we had some concerns about the confidence of patients um, coming onto a site, particularly speaking for my own trust for the Watford site has been um, very badly affected. Um, and we suspect that is exactly as you pointed out earlier to do with the, the sort of proximity to London and the commuter lines. Um, so, yes, we have been concerned about um, the confidence that patients have had. Um, we did see our A&E &E numbers um, shrink considerably. Um, but I have to say, looking at yesterday's numbers, they're back up to the numbers that we'd seen pre-COVID. So certainly people um, have got the confidence to come back to us. Um, 
managing a COVID pathway and a non-COVID pathway in A&E is complex. In effect, you need to split the department, you need to split your staff, and that's quite difficult to do. Uh, it slows things down, as you can imagine, in terms of the timeliness of, of seeing patients. Um, I think to pick up a point that was made earlier about children, we were very concerned about children returning to ED. Um, and what we had seen was some of them were arriving later than we would have seen previously. So we are absolutely encouraging with our commissioners and with primary care um, to get parents who are concerned about their children to come back to, to ED. And we are seeing the numbers rising. So I think to answer your question in a nutshell, some patients have um, certainly used other services um, and been comfortable with those. Um, however, we are seeing numbers um, creeping back up to pre-COVID levels. And generally, they are for patients who absolutely need acute care. OK, so the, so the reassurance is that we are heading towards pre-COVID levels of activity, but at the same time, we still have to undertake COVID activity. Can you, um, because there is a, 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 a public presence to this uh, to this meeting, can you can you say, um, Oh, lost my train of thought there. I'll, I'll come. I'll come back to you, Christine. Uh, okay. uh, referring back to Ron's question, um, I know it was answered, but I wonder, as chief executive of a hospital, are just 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 to be sort of categoric about this, are patients being tested before they leave hospital, before they go for recuperation, reablement, or back to their own homes or a care home? How how is that proceeding at the moment? Yeah, they absolutely are. The the guidance was very clear back in mid April. Um, and we are ensuring that patients are tested before before they leave us. Um, so that that is happening for those patients um, as they're just before they're discharged, making sure that those results are as they should be. And as Nicholas pointed out earlier, there are some care homes that we have designated collectively that they can manage um, COVID positive patients with all of um, the controls that we would put in place. But but yes, they are. And that is slowing things down for patients, but also for the discharge process, but it's the right thing to do. OK, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, you indicated that you'd like to uh, to uh, comment. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I just wanted to sort of raise the issue of um, health inequality, because, of course, technology has been a really positive thing for many uh, people in Hertfordshire, and they're really engaging with it. And definitely it's one of the things that I think we all need to keep. But there are people who um, are not able to engage with technology and also who um, are so fearful of what's happening that they are not seeking help from any service when they really need to. And um, I think this is something that we're all aware of. But my point is that I think that we need to prioritise proactively trying to get to these members of our population so that we can make sure that they are receiving um, the help that's needed. And certainly from a VCSE perspective, I think that organisations in our sector may be a very important part of that because, of course, we are close to people in the community. Uh, people do tend to sort of raise issues with us. But um, just really to sort of monitor, are we actually getting to people who are no longer engaging with health and care services because of the crisis? Interest, interesting question. Very happy for anybody else to come in. It's... Um... I suppose through the Shield and Sustain programme that some of our most vulnerable residents, and you've been involved with this, uh, Sarah, in, in your work, that with a comprehensive uh, food and medicine um, and constant checking and ringing up, that many of our, our most vulnerable have in fact been um, uh, looked after possibly more than they would have done um, before COVID. Uh, that's just, a, just an initial thought. Did anybody else want to have a comment on that it's about concerns about uh, uh, some not uh, picking up? Helen, come in. I, mean, I was just going to sort of echo your comment there about the shield and sustain work. Part of the thinking we were doing during the period, um, because the GDPR rules were relaxed, uh, we were able to do more data matching between uh, different agencies than we've been able to do previously. And so we have been able to compile a list really of people that we not great um, and it's about I guess efficient ways of reaching out to them so we've done all, we've done a comprehensive mail shot and we've also targeted these these individuals on that list of concern with some follow-up information. And just while, while you're there Helen 
um, Hearts Help was really ramped up, wasn't it, as well as setting up up the the care hub with uh, HCPA, which I think is still operating and still taking calls on a whole range of subjects uh, to meet uh, care providers' needs. Hearts Help was available for residents to call on a on on to ask anything that they uh, had concerns about, and uh, uh, that went up to a seven day operation with about yeah. thirty. Um, uh, uh, call handlers. That's uh, right, yeah. Anything to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it's still operating on a seven day basis. We're keeping that under review. Um, and I think one of the really exciting things about the period, if I put it like that, is that Hearts Help has become really well known, I think, as a brand, as a go to brand, and it's seen its um, proportion of calls that it would take, you know, far in excess of normal, uh, normal working. So I think that's been uh, something that's been really positive during the period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tom, you wanted to come in. Hi, hi, hi Richard. As a response to um, Sarah's question, uh, we, those of us who run community services, for example, we run uh, risk assessments on over 4,000 people um, just to make sure that we were able to provide care for them during this critical period. Um, assessments are based on their risk around COVID and mental health. And then we rag rated people. So Sarah, I think generally people who we know we've probably got up to an eye on, but I think your point is well made about people who are not in contact with our services, who we don't know, uh, who's picking those up. Interesting, Interesting Tom, and I guess that, that ties back to, goes back to Jenny Coles's point about schools not being open. And um, that, um, the, if you like, that uh, uh, intervention support not being there across for younger people and their families, um, and then the 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 tar the, the, uh, the the targeting of of, of that. Um, okay, well, um, th thanks for that, Tom. Um, can I ask anybody wish to comment on quite what the health and wellbeing board role might be as we come out of COVID, and what it is we'd like to capture from what has been intense partnership. Uh, work that's been done over the last three months. Um, anybody wish to really picking up on the points that um, Paul made at the top of this uh, 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 meeting uh, around the uh, socioeconomic and psychological impact, particularly in the autumn, particularly when there might be more unemployed um, and we have um, real difficulties in families. What should we be doing as a board now to prepare for that? Um, good. Jane, would you like to speak? Jane, help in. Uh, yes. Um, I think it's very important that what we do is is not only prepare in the terms that, that Jim and Ed and, and others have spoken of earlier uh, around the, the ability to run and sustain services. And, and to your point, Richard, I think a lot of the discussions that are going on at the moment at, at the service level are exactly that about how do we really get the, the benefits out of this this very enforced way of learning how to really work in, in partnership in a fundamentally different way, but that we also go uh, further and, and think about broader community resilience um, in, in at every level so that we, we yeah. don't um, yeah. overly pathologise, uh, if that's the right term, the, 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 our response. And, and I think actually it is a really good example of the health and the well-being aspects that sit under the board's remit. Um, Jim and Paul and I and, and, and others have started some, some early discussions uh, about that sort of what, what people refer to a little bit as sort of scaffolding and how do you how do you link up those different frameworks and, and support structures that are out there so that and, and signpost and navigate the broadest possible range of people to them in a way that gives them the opportunity to to uh, identify support uh, that is the right for, for them, not based on what a professional has necessarily um, suggested. There's, there's something really important here that I think that communities have experienced that COVID has made people feel very powerless, whether that's about employment or education or health. And I think it's really important uh, as a principle that the board takes going forward that, that we do everything we can to 
give power back to people and, and take a really enabling approach as opposed to a um, uh, professional um, uh, professional approach in, in terms of telling. Yeah, thank you, Jane. I, I suppose that echoes the uh, the social care approach of of really connecting all practice back into the community to build that resilience uh, that we need there, and we're going to need that um, uh, uh, hugely uh, going forward. I just wonder, Jane, uh, before I bring in Jim, and you both might want to comment. Um, it is it is within the media, uh, but I am not absolutely certain of the science uh, that particular communities, particularly Asian communities, BAME communities, um, have suffered uh, disproportionately compared to the rest of the population and have also been uh, some of our, our most vulnerable within the front line. Um, so my thanks to everyone who's who's been in the front line, whether social care or in hospitals. But do you have any comment on um, support uh, within our BAME community that we might need to take uh, more consideration of going forward? Yeah, if, if I if I make some observations, then and, and then I'm sure Jim Jim will probably uh, take take those uh, on further. As many of you will know, I am also a public health <laughs> uh, I know. specialist by background, so so I do have a, a bit of an interest, um, but will absolutely defer to, to Jim in in a professional sphere at this level. Um, we're doing a number of things particularly within the health sector at the moment, um, uh, where we have seen, as have many other sectors, that um, COVID has disproportionately affected uh, people from particular minority ethnic backgrounds. And that appears to be a combination of factors, as best we understand it at the moment, um, including um, the types of uh, roles that people do may expose them to higher levels of, of virus. Uh, it also may reflect um, differences in other risk factors uh, of uh, other illnesses so some uh, some ethnic minority groups being particularly uh, more likely to develop diabetes for example so so yeah. it's quite a complicated picture in terms of what our full understanding of, of why this is yeah. in terms of what we can do about it we're already um, undertaking risk assessment with with our entire staff right the way across the health sector Good. to to uh, help ask them to help us identify where they think they are more vulnerable so that we can respond and uh, in the necessary steps and, and I guess in a way it echoes what I've just said about trying to rather than tell people what you think they should have is ask them what they're worried about Absolutely. and see how you might be able to respond to that so that's, so that's very live at the moment for, for all of us. Thank you Jane really appreciate that. Uh, Jim and then it'll be Steve. Um, so, so firstly I'd like to agree with everything Jane uh, has said, um, uh, absolutely spot on. Um, I think the, uh, and said better than I could, um, I think the second thing I'd say is what we know about COVID is that the hardest impact has been on those populations who are already burdened in terms of inequalities in health and are least able to um, address that burden. So um, BAME communities uh, and some particular BAME communities have been uh, in the, the front line of impact for a variety of reasons. Um, and um, the recovery group and HR colleagues and the NHS and others are all working towards action plans on addressing Good. that. Good. Um, but similarly, people with disabilities, people with pre-existing conditions, um, are also uh, and people with um, ongoing mental health issues and people with learning disabilities have also been more vulnerable. Um, which I think brings me to the point about what could be the role of the board. I think there are uh, several things for the board to think about as priorities going forward. The first in my mind would be to be, if you like, a bit of a lighthouse um, looking across Hertfordshire for impacts and looking at where we haven't intervened or where we need to intervene and actually identifying priorities to the system. So, so be a, a kind of a sentinel, if you like, um, for how we recover from this. I think secondly, absolutely have the issues of inequality and inequity um, at its heart as a board because you've got everybody here. Um, and thirdly, 
look to join work up. So um, there's a whole lot of work going on on BAME populations that Jane has, has talked about. There's work going on in the county council with our employees. How do we join all of that work up together so that we we get the best out of it? And for example, one of the things we're looking at is the impact of um, on BAME small and medium enterprises to make sure that they are as biosecure, if you like, as possible. Well, how do we do that together? So I think there's a clear role for the Health and Wellbeing Board there. Thank you, Jim. That's really that's really helpful. Um, Steve, just to um, if you'd like to come in there, please. Yes, just a couple of comments. Firstly, <clears throat> I think what Jane called the enforced learning that we've been through is something that can help us going forward in terms of the long term plan and delivering that. We shouldn't just see it as something that's there to deal with COVID, but something we can learn from for long term. But I had a specific question about what's been called the excess deaths, something like a third of the number of people who died in excess of the normal numbers, not directly as a result of COVID. So I'm just wondering where people have views on how that's happened and what we can do about it, because clearly that's those are people who aren't dying directly as a result of COVID, dying for other reasons, and how we can actually minimise that. OK, thank, thanks for that, Steve. I wonder um, who could have got Jim, would you like to pick up on that, on excess deaths? Would you, um, to differentiate from COVID? Um, yes, I, I can do. Uh, I think there's um, uh, the best uh, gold standard, uh, and, and Jane will pick me up if I get this wrong, um, is is the all age, all cause mortality figures that tell you everyone who has died in an area because deaths related to COVID um, can be grouped into those deaths that have resulted from the infection itself and what it's done to the body. Um, those deaths which have resulted from other situations such as someone didn't seek healthcare treatment or um, something else happened or um, uh, the very small number of people um, who will have died for other reasons um, and then there's a whole group of other deaths that have happened at the same time that, that the Office of National Statistics are still looking into the causes of. So the very best measure is all age all cause mortality to get a view of excess deaths. And there's no doubt that nationally uh, and same in Hertfordshire, excess deaths have um, breached the five year average that we've had. Uh, and we need to have a good look at why and what can be done. And there will be a variety of causes and situations um, that we need to learn from in there. Is that answering okay. Stephen's question? I, th I think it is. I think, um, Jim, if and to, to um, almost to bring this to conclusion, I think it'd be really useful in September when the board meets if the issues of how we work together in our across our most vulnerable communities, including BAME and the others that you mentioned, Jim, and the way that we're working together and the deeper analysis around COVID um and the deeper analysis that you've just referred to that that comes back in september to give us a really good insight uh into a how we are dealing with this together and b uh, what difference we're going we're going to make that that is genuinely differently and genuinely more supportive in the community of the most vulnerable groups i think that would be really helpful um, and I think that captures the essence sort of in, in a sense of what Steve was talking about, uh, uh, bringing, bringing our, our understanding there. And there may be other areas that we'd wish to to pick up on as well. And I think the, the points about Jenny um, with the vulnerability with young children in families as well as adolescents, I think that would be really useful to bring that back at that time and to do this in the context of both COVID and then our recovery from that and post COVID. Um, which I guess is my wrapping up of that that particular item. Um, colleagues, I, I have uh, no further. Uh, uh, please note that uh, Tim's left the meeting. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you for letting us know. I have no further contributions to be made. Um, are you content that we note this report, but also note that we will want um, the Health and Wellbeing Board to hold our joint working to account and for us to um, acknowledge that? and certainly in our next meeting when we meet in September. So if you just uh, uh, 
uh, note in the in the usual way. That would be that would be fantastic. Um, uh, colleagues, I'm, I'm I'm not going to ask. I'm going to make an executive decision. We're going to take a five minute break. It is 11:55. We will resume at 12 o'clock. This will just give you a chance to get away from your screens for a moment and and uh, grab a drink, uh, whatever. Uh, and we'll resume at 12. And we'll kick off with um, Helen Minner's report on how the Volunteering People's Assistance Cell uh, coped with the Shielding Sustain programme. Thank you very much. If you just say, uh, if you just say when.
We're live. Colleagues, uh, I hope you've returned um, and uh, have managed to uh, uh, recharge your coffee or your or your uh, water glasses. And for those of the public, uh, thank you for uh, humouring us with uh, our absence for the last five minutes. I'd now like to uh, invite uh, Helen Maneuf to present her paper uh, explaining the work uh, of her supportive cell uh, in helping with the Shield and Sustain programme, which was foisted on us. Um, <laughs> literally, uh, the letter arrives and uh, we have to respond immediately. And uh, uh, Helen, uh, just at the, at the top of this, I can't thank you and your teams enough for the amount of work you've done, but um, please, if you could uh, make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So I'm here to introduce this update on work to support people uh, in Hertfordshire during the COVID period. Um, and the report summarises the two operations that we, we set up in response to the COVID challenge. Uh, firstly, Operation Shield, which is targeted at extremely clinically vulnerable people. And there are about um, 42,000 plus um, names of people in Hertfordshire categorised in that way. Um, and that's largely been about direct provision of food, but also about providing medicine and other support to uh, those shielders. Um, the second operation is called Operation Sustain, and that picks up really anyone else who needs support at this time, uh, helping them to stay at home, stay independent. And we think they're thereby acting to alleviate pressure on the, the broader health and social care system. Uh, and really the report tries to describe the sheer volume of the task. Um, Operation Shield is now well over 100,000 parcels delivered since inception. Um, and the report describes the way really in which partners across public sector agencies, the voluntary and community sector have come together powerfully really to help people and communities get the, the help that they need at the time. Report describes the important contribution of the voluntary and community sector um, for example, our Hearts Help support line running on a seven day basis, um, more than two and a half thousand checking calls made by carers in Hearts to people who are caring for loved ones at this time, uh, How Hills, our Meals on Wheels uh, and so much more uh, organisation has stepped up and really um, supported us. The work of Hearts community navigators and PCN link workers, how that's shifted to, uh, to working with those shielded individuals. Uh, and the report also picks up the role of members of the public who've offered their volunteering skills during this period. Uh, an amazing response to the call that went out and more than 5,000 of those volunteers deployed. So now we're looking to the future and planning the remainder of the COVID period. And we obviously had the announcement yesterday that um, the extremely clinically vulnerable group can stop shielding from 1st of August but that that categorisation will be um, remain, it will remain in place and the, the list will be maintained and government may well tighten advice to that cohort going forward if needed. So we'll need to keep an eye on that. Uh, we're also bringing our direct food provision operation to an end and we're working with people to help them access food um, for themselves rather than uh, maintaining that dependency. Um, and we'll reshape our operation sustain for the remainder of the period, um, making sure we're ready for any second peak or local outbreak work and addressing some of those emerging needs that have been picked up already this morning, pressures on household finances, perhaps a need for more information and advice, support with accessing via digital means um, and for those experiencing the various impacts of the aftermath of a period of prolonged social isolation. Finally, Chair, I think the longer term theme of the paper is about how we may build a legacy from this period, how we can build on the strengths that have been demonstrated, the partnership working, the contribution of the voluntary sector, our volunteers, um, and, and what that might look like going forward. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I think you're on mute. Thank you, thank you, Helen. Thank you, thank you for picking that up. I uh, was in, I was indeed a mood. I, I just couldn't, uh, to, just to, just to repeat. Thank you to colleagues, uh, both within the county council, but also there was Rubicon now called React, who are a lot of those ex-military veterans, uh, who helped support us after we've been running for a few weeks, uh, and to. Uh, 
uh, Taryn Pearson as well, who helped to coordinate the operation and is still there now. But perhaps most importantly, as you said, moving from a shielding to a sustain uh, uh, world, whereby um, uh, our residents are given the opportunity to re-engage with normality. Uh, and we move away from uh, direct deliveries to making sure that they are well supported. So thank you. Ian, would you like to come in? Yeah, very briefly, Chair, th thanks for um, letting me in so quickly. So again, my, my thanks to Helen. Um, Helen made the mistake of uh, saying she might have a little bit of capacity to help quite early on in the uh, in the pandemic and was immediately given uh, the task of running Operation Shield. And um, we can't underestimate the um, the effort involved from a standing start of turning what was an educational supplies warehouse into a food delivery operation. Um, and that was done within days and people were being supported uh, immediately. So Helen, Helen Duncan Turnbull, Taron, Glenn Facey and the team at the warehouse have done a, a fantastic job. And often guidance was being announced at the Downing Street briefing um, for reaction the next day. And again, all that was done by that team and we, we uh, offer a, a thanks to them. Um, and, and the voluntary sector who uh, have been with us shoulder to shoulder, really. So Sarah Wren and the Meals uh, team at, uh, at Hills, uh, but also the wider sector who were um, providing leadership locally, um, taking on cases and you know doing things like prescriptions and dog walking and all the stuff that just couldn't be done because people were shielding and had to stay indoors. Um, as Helen said, there are there are three issues really for a legacy really for this um, for this piece of work. Uh, one is literally thousands of people volunteered to get involved either with Operation Sustain or to the NHS um, and we must reach out to them and keep as many of them as possible to, to continue to volunteer and help their neighbours and local communities so we're giving some thought to that. Um, I do believe um, the voluntary sector stepped up to, to such a level it would be a shame to step them back down again and I think part of the legacy should be for the public sector to find some more resources to keep investing in those local community services that have sprung up in our towns and villages um, and so I've been lobbying uh, both County Council but also my NHS colleagues to think well how could that voluntary effort fit mm -hmm. into our strategic plans and I do believe it fits into the work of primary care networks and social prescribing and it fits into the work that the County Council's always operated uh, with our voluntary sector very closely um, and we shouldn't underestimate the, the, um, the work involved in now knowing 42,000 people we didn't know before. Um, only, only a small proportion of those were actively receiving social care services or ongoing health services. Um, and we knew there was some unmet need out there and now it's very visible to us. So there's a piece of work as part of our recovery um, to get to know those people better and make an offer to them. And I think the voluntary sector could be a big part of it um, alongside the public sector. So thanks again to all involved and in thanks for giving me the time to speak. Thank you very much, Ian. That's, that's appreciated. Um, uh, uh, David, David Lloyd. Thank you, Richard. Um, one of the bits on the infographic um, talks about uh, volunteers and the number who um, were um, deployed against the number who volunteered. Um, and I think one of the great things about COVID, one thing we might learn for the future has been how much um, the public wants to volunteer, wants to pull together, wants to try and support. And I think that's brilliant. And I think that uh, the County Council's done a, an excellent job um, in terms of uh, trying to, to get those people in. I just wondered what we're doing with those who have volunteered but haven't actually been found a role. So I think there's about half of them from the infographic um, uh, haven't actually been deployed. Now, there would be a wide variety of reasons for that. I understand that. But I just wonder how we're keeping them um, uh, updated, how we're ensuring that they're still, uh, their, their wish to serve is, is, is noted and that we might manage to find things uh, to do with them in the future. I think yeah. just before Helen, just before Helen comes in, I think, David, your question is even more apposite because the potential for people wanting to volunteer may increase in the autumn uh, as we have post furlough uh, potential fallout in the uh, in, in the employment market. Um, and uh, I'm sure I, 
I will let Helen uh, mention Owen Mapley's letters and uh, and uh, engagement. But um, Helen, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. We've seen very much been very mindful of of um, wanting to remain in communication with those volunteers. Um, obviously, it takes some time to work through the offers of support and to make sure all the various checks are in place. Um, and our CVS partners in this have, have really worked incredibly hard um, on that agenda. We are keeping in touch with our volunteers that we haven't deployed. We've, as you said, Richard Owen sent them um, at least two letters to, to thank them and to ask them to bear with us. Um, the most recent communication we, we had with them was a bit of a survey, really, just to check out where they are on, on this. Do they still want to volunteer? Um, and a promise to them, if they do, that we'll find a role for them in due course as part of phase two as part of the recovery or if they didn't and that was you know something that they were able to do at that moment but no longer can then to thank them and and to recognize that, that that they were there if we had have needed them so we're trying to get the right balance of communication with that group and not wishing to be parochial but i absolutely i'm going to be in decorum we we um through the community action decorum able to deploy getting on for nearly 100 percent of all the volunteers that came forward and they were deployed into our existing uh, voluntary uh, network, uh, voluntary sector network, and to, to reinforce those charities as they did their work through the epidemic. And I think this, there is probably some learning to come out of that. And I suppose the, the broader point um, is that we would, as we, as we try to build community resilience, which is going to be sorely tested in the autumn, how we work ever closer with our voluntary sector and our volunteers uh, to build that community resistance, moving as far as possible, statutory services back into the community to, 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 to build from within, as opposed to doing to, uh, I think is going to be really interesting. And, um, and I, I really think that the, the learning and part of the legacy you referred to comes from our action and our, on our residents stepping forward uh, to make the contribution that they have done. Uh, I don't think we can underestimate um, national national response, uh, national disaster, if you like, the pandemic is. And the first thing that happened is our communities say we can help. And that's just brilliant. Um, and you, Helen, is absolutely brilliant. You had to step forward to coordinate all of that. But there we go. So um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are very grateful. I also should give thanks as well to some others. Uh, for example, those that donated food, that supported volunteers with anything from as much as parking arrangements to their lunches and all that sort of thing. Um, and, but, uh, and a big thank you to our voluntary sector who just stepped forward uh, to work with our new volunteers. Um, and enough from me. So I will uh, invite uh, Terry Heritage to, uh, to speak and then Sarah. Thanks, Richard. Um, my comments sort of straddle the previous item and this one, um, and I've associate myself very much with the comments made by Jane, uh, um, Jim, Ian, and now yourself around uh, community. I think I think communities are the strongest um, asset for our county. Um, communities do rally, and actually communities want to help each other. So I found that in my own community, they, that everybody will come out and help. Um, and I should say, no matter the politic, which is, I think, a real leveller um, indeed. Um, the County Council has always supported uh, the Community Compact. Um, this is something that um, when I was in the localism role, um, I worked with Ian McBeath to actually redevelop this and reinvigorate it. Um, and I think, again, we come around in circles, don't we, um, that, the, that the Health and Wellbeing Board could perhaps use that um, and social valuing in our commissioning arrangements across the public sector so that we can um, reinforce again and reinvigorate our relationships with the charitable sector that we have so we can ensure that monies are going the right way. Um, so that that is what I would think that um, the Health and Wellbeing Board could potentially do. But I'd be interested to hear what Sarah's got to say because I see that she wishes to speak as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. A good point well made. Sarah, can I bring you in? 
thank, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, a lot of colleagues' comments have been music to the VCSE sector's ears, um, particularly around sort of wanting to engage more with us and to uh, give funding as well. But it's not just a case, I think, of, of handouts. I think the important learning that, that we as a sector have had uh, during this period is that genuinely, if we are in the heart of solutions, if we are really working together um, as a whole system, we can really um, give assistance to the people who are in most need. Um, and, and certainly, I think the opportunities that we've had to work together as a sector have, have also been very useful. And we've had opportunities to uh, meet together, facilitated by the County Council, which have been excellent. And we really, really don't want to lose those. Uh, I think just another point, though, that I, I need to make is that there is also um, need within the sector and there are a lot of smaller charities, many yeah. of them led entirely by volunteers, sometimes led by older people who themselves have been required to shield, who are really struggling and mm. um, have not really had the resource to be able to keep going. And I think at a time when we're going to need this sector to be able to rebuild, we also need to think about how we can support those smaller charities so that they can be um, here with us in the longer term as well. Yeah, you know, I think a point well made, Sarah. I think we, how we, um, how we, it builds into the recovery phase of and supporting the normality of our um, our, our, our our charitable sector um, is, is 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 as much part of that as uh, as our health and social care provision. Um, is the uh, is there anybody else that was indicating that they wanted to to come in? In which case. No, thank you. Um, I'm really grateful for those uh, contributions. Helen, thank you for for presenting that. And uh, only yesterday, of course, we found out um, the detail that you referred to that by the 1st of August, this will this will wind down. But I think the reassurance there is that we will need to be available, as we all will, across health and social care um, to be able to to spot those that um, they may no longer be shielded, they may no longer be on a sustained program, but they may well uh, be in touch at some point in in uh, if things don't uh, uh, work out too well. Um, so, uh, without further ado, we will we will move on. But uh, in the uh, in the usual way, are we okay with to to note this report, but also to pick up uh, the points that were made um, around legacy and the voluntary sector? Okay. Thank you very much. Our next item um, is to be uh, is to be introduced by Sir Finger Rai, and this is the um, uh, the, the Hertfordshire's approach to supporting adults with complex needs, um, which is very apposite uh, through the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, this covers homeless people, for example, all of whom have been accommodated during this period. But Sir Finger, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Chair. This is Sukhvinder Rai, Development Manager. But before I do um, any more talking, I'll bring Helen in um, first because Helen and I want to introduce the report. Oh, my, my apologies, Helen. Well, I didn't want to put Sukhvinder on the spot. I've prepared an introduction, but Sukhvinder is the brains behind the whole strategy. So uh, let me yeah, do I my know. blurb and then yeah. if, if Sukhvinder wants to come in. Um, so the strategy sets out um, an approach for supporting adults who have complex needs and who, as a result, are often at risk of losing their home. Um, and this strategy will eventually lead to a refocusing, we believe, of the way in which Hertfordshire County Council spends some £500, five, £5 million pounds a year, rather, of what is known as housing related support funding. Adults with complex needs may struggle to sustain a home for themselves and may find themselves in a vicious circle where a lack of appropriate and timely preventative support can mean losing their home, which in turn can mean an escalation and a deepening of need. And section five of Sukhvinder's report shows that many people who approach councils for assistance with housing or homelessness also self-report that they have support needs. And it is this cohort that our strategy is targeting. The County Council uses its HRS funding to deliver a number of different services, but provision is inconsistent, I think, with a geographical disparity and pathways for people who are seeking support aren't always as clear as we'd want them to be. So the strategy aims to bring some of that clarity and a focus on timely preventative help. 
Our work is underpinned by a JSNA analysis by public health colleagues. It draws on data sets relating to homelessness, but a word of caution in that these data sets changed in 2017 with the Homelessness Reduction Act. And so there's more to do, we believe, on data before we fully understand the, the prevalence and can design responses accordingly. The intention when this strategy was drafted was to move into a planning period where we would pilot our thinking, uh, evaluate the impact of that pilot work and then use that to carefully design and shape commissioning approaches. Obviously, the COVID period uh, um, has meant that events have taken over. Um, and what happened with rough sleepers in particular was that the government set up an initiative called Everyone In. And in response, Hertfordshire created a accommodation cell, which had the role of making sure that all of those rough sleepers were housed for the COVID period. That cell is now in a phase of looking at how it can move those um, people that have been accommodated into more suitable provision than the initial temporary short term provision that was made available. And the group is working in a really coordinated multi agency way to assess the needs of the group and to try and design the right support to enable them to move on in a sustained way. And so we find that the COVID period is allowing us to test the principles of the strategy in practice. And I guess in a much more extensive way than we envisaged with our with our pilot work that we'd originally planned. Um, so therefore building our understanding of what's going to be needed for the future. Thank you, Chair. I don't know if Sukvinda wants to come in. Thank you for that introduction, Helen. That's that's lovely. Thank you, Sukvinda. And I, I'm going to, um, uh, if you could just uh, uh, introduce yourself and your role as well as as well as the uh, further detail in, in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm Sophinda Ryan, Development Manager in Adult Care Services Complex Needs. So I lead on the complex needs agenda. And as Helen Minerva explained there, this is a cohort of individuals that have multiple needs. And often they are faced with homelessness or are actually homeless, homeless within temporary accommodation or homeless on the street. Um, the services that Adult Care Commission at the moment to, to deliver housing related support across a spectrum of need. So it could be very low level support for those that need short term interventions over two months because they've lost their employment, for example, and need support to get back on their feet. Or it could be up to 18 months or slightly longer for individuals that have got quite complex, multiple issues around mental health, drug and alcohol, um, domestic abuse, for example, or ex-offenders as well. So as, as um, we were saying in the report, we were due to start a planning process with further engagement with stakeholders using evidence-based approach, collecting data to understand what the demographics look like, what the support looks like in those areas, so that we respond effectively what COVID has done is brought about an opportunity to fast track some of those principles um, and that planning uh, period had to be done here and now, particularly around that rough sleeper group. So as part of the everyone in directive from, from the government, um, districts had to work really hard over a period of a weekend to get people off the street and into accommodation. Um, and the commissioned housing related support services supported those individuals in those hotels and emergency accommodation. So it's brought about um, the opportunity to work in a very partnership way to collect the data, to understand with a public health led approach what the support needs are to make sure that we provide safe ongoing solutions to this group. So those that are clinically vulnerable are able to isolate and, and stay shielded for that for that period and, and get health services to them. Um, and it's brought about that opportunity to work in partnership with um, mental health, the PCC, probation um, and also drug and alcohol services as well, making sure that we focus on services that join up around the person rather than the person joining up the services and that was a key point of the method of st strategy itself. I'll stop there if anybody has any questions. Thank you Sigvinda, that's 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 lovely. Um, what I took from what I took from your report was that in Hertfordshire, yes there are areas where 
there is very little homelessness or it's well below the national average and there are other areas which are massively above uh, and that might be Broxbourne, it might be Watford and Hartsmere is there as well but just sort of um, uh, bumping along in the average and I think it's really important that the paper sets out a new approach about how we might uh, stabilise accommodation for individuals uh, and then can deal with their uh, their, 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 their problems and issues uh, and hopefully start to uh, un, un, un prevent that, that cycle that they, they get stuck on. Um, so that was really, really, the paper is really helpful. Um, colleagues, who have I asked? Uh, David, uh, would you like to come in first? Thanks. For, thanks very much, Richard. Um, I suppose uh, I mean I'm, I'm very very supportive uh, of this approach. Um, uh, in in some ways, I think it's you know one of the most important things um, that we'll talk about today. Uh, I, I think that uh, we need to join up um, all strands of local government, both in terms of governance, but especially in terms of output. Um, this is a way of doing it. Um, I was a little surprised in my um, reading the papers that I didn't um, get a stronger sense of the things we've tried to do already. Um, there was, of course, that um, pilot that we had um, down in Three Rivers and Hartsmere, which didn't really work as well as it might. Um, and it might be helpful for us to, to revisit that um, quite formally, just to, to make sure that we pick up what went wrong um, uh, because we, we we decided at the time not to continue with that. There were good reasons at the time, but I think it might be helpful just for us to be certain that um, we have picked up the lessons from it and that we are going to, um, uh, you know, learn learn from them uh, in, in what we're doing. But I, I think it's it's clearly the right way forward. It brings all the agencies together. Um, and, and I'm uh, very supportive of it, but uh, um, Linda might wish to, to come back on, on that. What did we learn from the pilots which we had down in the south of the county? Good, good point, David. So what did we learn from Three Rivers? And then what is the new pilot for Broxbourne? Uh, uh, what is that about? Um, so, Sukhvinder. Thank you, Chair. So in answer to that question, what's new about the Broxbourne pilot and how does that compare with the previous, previous complex needs pilot that was tested? Um, a significant piece of legislation came into play, the Homelessness Reduction Act, um, which set about pathways um, for all agencies to refer individuals to district councils where there was um, a housing need as well as a, a support need too. So that, that was a referral pathway, and that's what's unique about the Brook Broxbourne needs um, pilot here. It's making sure that we've got a single pathway into services, working with districts, which gives the opportunity to provide that integrated housing and support service onto the appropriate pathways for that individual. The complex needs pilot, um, the learning that was taken from there was that a much longer period of time was required to evaluate the outcomes um, of that, although the individuals in the provision um, did benefit from the services and some positive outcomes in terms of health were achieved, the evaluation um, could not extend to other outcomes in terms of prevention of homelessness um, and reoffending. Um, but there was an opportunity to see if partners wanted to explore that for a much longer period of time. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, are you okay? David, did you want to come back at all? Are you okay with that? Uh, no, I, I think that, that does uh, answer much of it, and I think the change in legislation um, probably has been helpful. It did strike me at the time that um, one of the problems that we probably do need um, to, to think about in advance is very often the, the, the partners who are funding and providing the service aren't necessarily the partners who will be getting the benefit in terms of, uh, of uh, services not used. So, for example, it may well be that very little funding comes in from the criminal justice part, but that, and you'll see on that uh, presentation, a significant part of the criminal justice system um, is not used if we get it right. Similarly, very often, yeah. it seems that it's health which gets 
a, a disproportionate amount of, um, of of benefit in terms of funding. I think it's useful for us to go in with our eyes open around that um, because I think that that can cause problems further on if um, if the districts are putting up say 90 percent of the of the funding but are getting 10 um, percent of the 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 benefit that might be um, something which will be difficult I think we just need to think through I'm not suggesting by the way that uh, districts will necessarily be putting in 90 percent of the funding but I, I I just think we need to to know that up front so that we don't then um, uh, have the same problems that we did before well, I'm, I'm going to let Richard Casty, who's going to come in a moment, correct whether the districts are putting in 90% of the funding, because I, I have a sneaky suspicion that that's coming mainly from the county council, although it's quite contentious that the money is with the county council, uh, for those that have been around a while. Um, I Housing, and therefore housing for who, whom are our most vulnerable residents, those that find themselves without accommodation. And that doesn't necessarily mean your traditional homeless person, but somebody who literally maybe be between jobs, suddenly can't buy, afford the rent and finds themselves falling into a void. Um, that is the um, that is where we really need to bring our partnership strength to play. And I think the Health and Wellbeing Board recognised that when it put housing as a priority. Uh, but I'll bring, I'll bring in, thank you for contribution there, David. I'll bring in Richard Cassidy. Yeah, I think that's just, just really support what you were just saying, um, Richard. I mean, obviously, I'm not, I don't want to come on the funding because the funding for housing and homelessness is extraordinarily Machiavellian, isn't it, in terms of how it sort of passed down from government to uh, the relevant agencies but but I do think in the first part of the meeting we we didn't really talk about preventing homelessness um, when we talked about our response to Covid and I was sort of hanging on for this paper and this paper is quite rightly uh, concentrating on the very complex cases that we have with with um, particularly vulnerable ad adults and and rough sleeping but I think the point that you just started to make there preventing homelessness is very much broader than that um, and there is a huge challenge for housing authorities, you know, working with partners in preventing homelessness in general. Um, as we know, homeless people are particularly vulnerable group, you know, mental health, physical safety, crime, as well as COVID. And I think, I think really for this paper, there, there has been a focus on the very complex cases where people are rough sleeping um, and the move to place all people who are rough sleeping into temporary accommodation. So that clearly is mitigated under COVID, some of the particular health risks. And I think it was highlighted in the paper at the ending of those sort of government uh, requirements for those rough sleeping being housed in temporary accommodation hotels there's a huge challenge for all agencies to ensure that they don't return to the streets but the the primary challenges facing those at risk of becoming homeless very very much remain you know, the shortage of an increasing demand on social housing the very high private rental prices in Hertfordshire coupled with the people's inability to find rental deposits so I think I think we must recognise as a board that the a key issue is that homelessness is only going to be exacerbated by the severe economic downturn we're likely to have, um, and the rising unemployment at the end of furloughing. So yeah. along with the ending of the ban on evictions for arrears, I mean, I'm very concerned that landlords will be planning to move to evict tenants who fall into debt, and this will become a crisis for us going into the winter months. I I I. I. I couldn't agree more, Richard. Uh, you might want to just stay there a moment. Um, the um, the autumn is going to see a greater pressure in this area, as you describe and that we recognise. Um, Paul Burstow was hinting at how we might need to address that. I've been talking with my colleagues as well uh, on exactly this issue. I, I think the my sense is uh, that the the Health and Wellbeing Board needs to hold to account and through our own organisations how we are to approach the autumn and do we bring the same sense, that uh, collective sense of partnership strength to dealing with um, post-Covid and post-furlough as we have done to Covid itself. I think it's really fundamental and I, I hope one of the recommendations coming out of this is that we approach that with some vigour. Um, because I think that this is almost SCG territory as much as it is, well, we'll do something when we arrive at that point. Um, Richard, you may be able to help me. Um, 
government did suggest uh, some little while ago now that it, it recognised, this may be coming out of the Louise Casey work, uh, recognised that more housing is of needed specifically for those that find themselves dropping out of um, accommodation. I don't know if you, are you able to update at all on that or is... Um, I haven't got huge details, as you know, Dame Louise Casey is working um, on, on that as a topic and she's been popping up in a lot of uh, various sort of um, governments and officer groups, you know, around the country sort of advocating for this work. I, I don't have the detail in terms of where okay. that, that research no, is from. No, 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 no problem. Richard, but thank you. Think, just, just a final yeah. comment. I do think, you know, talking about the September meeting, it's something we very much as a board need to keep an eye on in terms of how, uh, you know, the, the pressure on homelessness ha is increasing. Yeah. Thank you, and, and will do. Um, thank you, Richard. Can I can I bring in uh, Martin? Um, uh, trying to ah, I have unmuted. Yes, there we are. Uh, I totally agree with uh, the comments uh, as has been said of both ri yourself, Richard, and the other Richard um, on this. It, we're, I'm in a meeting this afternoon talking about our reaction to homelessness going forward. We're looking at obviously the cost of putting people into hotels and so on. But the important thing is I think we, we don't focus on who, get wh who gets which bit of funding. We concentrate on practical solutions where we work together. I think we've learned a great deal from working together, the hearts leaders uh, on, on the whole of this um, um, pandemic. And I think on homelessness, this is something and, and not just those with particular needs, but also um, everyone who is going to be in that situation and look for positive solutions and realise just how big a problem it is. So thank you for both contributions yourself and, uh, and the other Richard. So thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, and uh, was there anybody else wanted to come in? Uh, Tom, did you want to or was that uh, did you something just flashed up? Um, no, OK. Um, and Teresa, did you want to come back or, or not? Just trying to. Uh, sorry, Teresa's come off my screen. No, that's all right, Richard. I was I was just absolutely agreeing with what both Richard said. OK, so, that, that, yeah, it needs to say it needs to stay as a priority for the Health and Wellbeing Board. It's really, really important, um, especially for those with uh, mental health problems. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Um, well, th thank you. The, the, the recommendations um, are to support the strategy, which goes without saying. Um, I've got strange things coming up my screen now. Sarah Wren has just come up. Sarah, did you want to come in? Uh, no, I didn't. Thank you. My, my, OK, so not sure why that did that. OK, no worries. Um, so the recommendations to, to the paper. Um, actually, Sigvinda, do you want to, to take us through those recommendations? Just a fine chair, I'm happy to do that. Just, so just the, very briefly, yeah. Yeah, so the as section three invites the board to support the strategy and um, to allow our team to do that planning period. Um, all that recognising that we've got the rough sleeper cohort who we're responding to right now with the data. Um, and the final recommendation is to note the work through the accommodation, so our recovery group, um, that we actually test the principles of strategy through that. OK, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Colleagues, if um, if you'd like to, um, you've, you've heard the recommendations, if you'd like to uh, comment on that. Uh, and uh, Savinda, thank you and Helen for taking us through that paper uh, and for the engagement there from uh, from our district colleagues. That's really helpful. Thank you. And I think I take us through now to um, our final item, which really um, I'm going to ask Ian to introduce, but is the recognition that happened a little while ago that the STP, um, our Sustainable Transformation Plan across Hertfordshire and West Essex, has now transmogrified into the integrated care system. Um, Ian, if you would like to, uh, uh, you don't need to introduce yourself, um, <laughs> but uh, if you could uh, it, it just introduce this and it's uh, and, and quite what you'd like us to do with it. Perhaps well, mention so, James. So a mercifully, uh, yeah, a mercifully uh, short paper, and perhaps Jay might want to come in, or, or Paul, right, right at the end. Um, so a two-page paper, recognising that we hadn't met as a board since January. Um, in the month of April, our sustainability and transformation 
partnership was invited by NHS England Improvement to put itself forward to become an integrated care system. Uh, what's the difference? Well, um, in a nutshell, it gives the partnership more powers to uh, set its own finance performance and quality targets and measure measure its own progress against those targets rather than the regional office doing doing that regional NHS <coughs> office, I should say, uh, doing that for us. Um, and, and and sort of permission to to act as um, a more autonomous uh, partnership, really. Um, so we put ourselves forward in the month of, of March. Uh, obviously, in the NHS long term plan that was written about this time last year, one of the main objectives is that every area does become an integrated care system and takes that responsibility um, for itself. We put that forward and we were told in mid April that we've been successful. So we've actually put in the pack of papers, I think it's item 14 <coughs> online, the uh, the document that we put forward and the letter that we received back from NHS England. And we just thought it was fitting for the Health and Wellbeing Board to formally receive that. Yes. Uh, and also to mark uh, Jane Halpin's uh, appointment as, uh, as Chief Officer of our three CCGs and of the new integrated care system. So that's all I was going to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And I think the only thing I might add, if you uh, just want to stay there for a moment, the only thing I might add uh, is I, I, I think the, uh, the integrated and coordinated health and social care that we have seen over the last three months, bringing together those partners across our local, uh, local government, our district boroughs and, and county and our voluntary sector with health, just to me uh, highlights how well we work together in Hertfordshire. Uh, and so as our, as our ICS develops, I hope that we really can bring the focus on how we can optimise that um, and be efficient and effective in Hertfordshire. Uh, and I have as no disrespect to West Essex, but I think working with Essex County Council uh, is is a is a is a different uh, dynamic, uh, and I don't think that that necessarily helps us as a collective uh, to build our strength. Uh, and let's face it. We are going to have massive both national and local challenges from this autumn onwards as our economy tries to recover from from the COVID pandemic. Um, so I really do wish uh, Jane uh, and Paul Berso uh, and uh, those of us that are, are are working with the ICS um, to, to really to really wish it well. Is there, is there anybody else wishing to comment um, about about this? I suppose in some ways it is self evident, isn't it? Colleagues, you appear to be uh, ready for lunch. Um, I am going to. Um, so, if we're if we're happy to accept this, and I can see no reason why not, um, can I um, uh, uh, thank you uh, profusely for bearing with for the last uh, two and three quarter hours? That, that's a long meeting, uh, but we've covered some really serious uh, matter, and we've also, I think, uh, built our agenda for September. Uh, and as we approach September, I hope I hope that we maintain um, the dynamic of really working so well together across our sectors uh, from now and until we meet again. And so with that, thank you so very much. And for those of you watching, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Goodbye now.